What is going on, everybody? Welcome back here to another installment of Honest and Uneducated, the show where we talk about anything from movies, movie news, video games, comic books, collectibles, all sorts of fun stuff like that. Joining me today is none other than just John Knight himself here. Rick Metz is feeling a little bit under the weather. So, John, how are you? How are you doing today? Uh, pretty good. Not only am I joining you, I'm joining you in studio, which for the second time. And when we found out Rick was going to be here, I, I guess I'm just kind of playing the part of Rick today. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I took over his chair and I, I'll try and do my best to live up to his reputation. But Rick will be glad to have you back soon. For sure. And then this time, obviously, we don't have. I was going to correct this anyway, but last time you came in, we couldn't get the mic. We had some audio issues. Yeah. And I, I rectified that this week because I got another mic to use with the mixer and everything. Turns out we didn't need to do it because now you're just uh, you're just filling in for in that spot. But either way, we're not going to have any audio issues today. So hopefully, I wanna, <laughs> it wouldn't be a show if there weren't technical issues. So mm -hmm. we'll just have to wait and see. But nevertheless, we have some we have some good stuff in here. So first, do not forget, guys, you can submit topics and questions to the show just by emailing us at honestanduneducated at gmail.com. That's honestanduneducated at gmail.com. Now, it just, if there's anything that you think we should cover or want us to cover on the show, just send it that way, as long as it's, you know, relevant, and obviously. And then uh, if you can't always catch the show here on YouTube, the audio-only version goes up on all the podcasts. You know, whatever podcast network you use, Spotify, iTunes, whatever, it's all there. Just search Honest and Uneducated. It will be there. And then, obviously, every Wednesday we do our statue reviews and, you know, hot toys reviews and all that. And we stream every Friday, so come hang out with us and do that as well. But let's get into our first topic here. And the first one's a big one. We got a, a pretty huge pretty huge deal here with that Netflix. I don't know who got the better end of this deal. I, I'm kind of leaning to... I really don't know. I think it's a great deal for both. Netflix has essentially bought exclusive streaming rights for Sony properties here. So they paid... I believe it was about a billion dollars for the next four years to have exclusive uh, rights to all of Sony's properties. So that's Spider-Man, like Jumanji. If they keep making bad boys, as you see here, we'll have that. But th those are just some of the bigger ones. And uh, I think this is, like I said, I'd be curious to know which one you think got the better deal here. Because this is also, like I forgot too, like Morbius, Uncharted's coming out. So all those, like Sony's, Kind of going full steam ahead with, you know, they made the whole new uh, production development team ex exclusively for their video game properties, because obviously Sony has a ton of very successful video games, and they're actually going to be making those into, you know, movies. They, they made a their own film division to actually focus on the, the video game adaptations, and they're starting with Uncharted. But this is a huge deal, and not just because, you know, all the movies get to go on Netflix, but for on Sony's end, they really they got paid a billion off the top by Netflix just for the exclusive rights for for their titles, and then Sony still gets paid out per movie by Netflix. So it's a pretty insane deal on Sony's. I think I almost think Sony worked out. They, they kind of got the better end of this because Sony is in like a very unique position in this streaming wars climate because you have Universal with Peacock, and then you have Paramount with Paramount Plus, Warner has HBO Max. You, you, all these companies have made their own streaming services. Disney with Disney Plus, to name another one. And so all of their properties are just going straight to their streaming services. But that left Sony in the position of, do they spin up their own, dump billions of dollars into making their own streaming service? Or do they just, since they're kind of the odd man out right now, like arguably one of the biggest and better studios out there too. They have they have some very good properties, just like I, I named a few earlier. They they're just in a position where they could just still keep licensing off their properties now. They and like that's that's essentially what they did. They went and they uh, talked to all of the you know studios out there. Like Disney put a bid in, uh, like everybody. Peacock, Universal. They sat down with everyone. Netflix gave them the best deal, obviously, because it's a pretty killer deal. And they went with that. So, John, what do you think about this? Is there a who do you think got the better end of this deal here? Because I think on the the opposite side of the coin, Netflix being kind of like Netflix isn't going to go anywhere. Obviously, they've they've been the big the big boy on the block for the longest time here. They were the first streaming company out of the gate, really. 
they have the most subscribers still to this day. But the one thing they've always been lacking was that prime original content. Like they've yeah. they've always been consistent with putting out like Netflix originals, but they don't have uh, like aside from Stranger Things, they never really had anything that was like a global phenomenon. Like they've had some good stuff come out like yeah. in the later years with like Witcher and all these things, but that was still. That was them acquiring rights to something. It wasn't something they developed, yeah. like technically speaking. But um, so this is huge for them too in that regard. This, for the next four years, they're going to have this massive library of Sony titles there. So, what are your thoughts on this, though? Uh, I was actually, I mean, <clears throat> when you initially when we talked about going over this today, I was, I thought it was a very good deal for um, both sides. Obviously, I think that Sony is uh, my, my initial thoughts were that Sony is making a really smart move here. Uh, as we saw back in the nineties and early two thousands with all the tech companies and startups, like the hot new trendy thing to do doesn't always work out for everybody. Um, well, the hot new trendy thing to do right now in entertainment is start your own streaming service and stream as much content as you can on it. Um, <clears throat> but we've talked about it before, like, all, all those people who were cord cutters, you know, five, 10 years ago are now looking at it and going, well, wait a minute, where's all the savings? Like, yeah, I, I used to be able to cut out my cable bill and stream with Netflix and get almost just as much content. But now you've got, you know, 37 different streaming services out there subscribed to you. You actually end up paying more um, <clears throat> to get access to all the different things you need. So I think there's going to be a tipping point with the streaming wars at some point. Um <clears throat> People are going to say, hey, enough's enough. I don't have, you know, 10, 15 bucks a month for 10 different services. I mean, you know, I, I'm back to paying as much, if not more than I was when I had like my cable plans and stuff. Um, so in that respect, I think Sony's being smart about it. One of the things I thought when, when you were going over what you were going over is I'm actually a little worried just because personally, I, I love the MCU so much and I love the fact that Marvel has all of their characters right now, including Spider-Man. This deal, however, sends one of those major MCU characters, Spider-Man, over to Netflix uh, for streaming. So when you go to watch the MCU movies on Disney Plus, you're going to be have you're going to miss out on you know at this point what is it five percent, three, four, five percent of of the MCU because the Spider-Man movies aren't going to be available there. Mm -hmm. um, not, not the worst thing in the world. I mean, they, they, they don't make them, you know, you have to see them to understand the other movies, but it is, it's a nice little tie in and, and they, and they do. And there are things that are important from them that, um, that add more to the MCU, add more depth and characters to the MCU. Uh, and I also just wonder if this isn't, if Disney's going to look at this deal and say, you know what, Sony, you know what, fine, we're, we're done. We're not going to re-up any future contracts and, and we're going to, we're going to reach a point where, um, this is going to contribute to the MCU losing Spider-Man or, or a version of Spider-Man in it, which, which would be disappointing. Now I'm going way off the reservation with this whole talk with that, but, but I'm just, you know, looking down the line and seeing what, what the ramifications of this, this could be. But as far as the deal itself, like I said, I think Sony's making a smart move because, I don't think that the, the, the industry can sustain as many streaming services as there are. I think at some point there is going to be a tipping point and some of these, some of these companies just aren't going to make it. Um, so, and then obviously Netflix is, you know, securing their long-term, um, well, at least, I mean, four years, it's relatively long-term um, content drought that they were facing, so. Well, yeah, and too, you brought up uh, something else too, which is I think I think this in the end speaks to like Sony's kind of longer game here. It was like they've it kind of indicates that they've decided that they're just gonna be they're not gonna jump on that train. You know, they're yeah. not gonna make their own streaming service and stuff because you said that um, it's it's not movie related, but it is like video games. Like I kind of mentioned, are a big part of Sony's production and revenue in yeah. general. And you said that uh, was it MLB the Show? Yeah. Like that's been an exclusive game uh, on for for Sony, and uh, apparently uh, the a Sony development team still is still is making the game, but they've now like essentially 
licensed it to like Microsoft and I guess who maybe even Nintendo, I guess could get it at some point at this sure. point. So like, even with that, it kind of just shows that they're, it's not exactly the same. It's a different division of, you know, Sony, but it still kind of indicates that they're, it's like they're in the same position as the film company or the film division right now. It's like they're producing content and just licensing it out. Like that's kind of like yeah. what their end game is, is, is kind of looking at, which is, I think it's smart because like you said, I really don't see every one of these streaming services working. Like I wouldn't be surprised if like, even though like Peacock and Paramount, they have a good library of titles. Like Peacock has, I mean, they have, they have all of Universal stuff's under there. Then all of NBC stuff is under there. So, I mean, you got The Office, you got Fast and the Furious. You have, there's a ton of stuff that Universal has. But like Peacock, even though it has the worst name of all of them, <laughs> like the absolute worst name of all the streaming services, it's not really that bad of a service. And then Paramount, they also have like, a, they have good stuff. They have Star Trek. They have the Mission Impossible stuff. Like they have good stuff too. But in the end, well, then CBS as well, obviously. So, like, yeah. they have a ton of t television and movie stuff. But, like, Paramount, of all the film you know, production studios, they've been hurting the most in the last 10 years because they haven't had big blockbuster titles like everyone else has. Like, I just, I remember, I forget what the exact number is, but, like, Paramount, like, was at the bottom, like, a year or two ago of, like, movie studio, like, like revenue in the entire year, it was a very small amount, like three hundred million dollars or something, was like yeah. all they made. Or something. And it, in a world where you know Disney made like over eight billion, like Paramount was sitting with like a cool three hundred million dollars, like it's, they haven't been doing good. So it's like, how long is it going to be until you know? Because like CBS All Access, for instance, that was what Paramount Plus was before. It didn't really take off at all. Yeah. Like they they made all these Star Trek shows and they're hoping that would get some people in, but I mean they they already had to rebrand to Paramount Plus. Well, and this the CBS All Access and and, and Paramount stuff specifically too, it, it's really <clears throat> it's one of these odd situations where people associate certain shows and certain things with certain channels, but those channels don't necessarily produce those shows. So one of CBS's biggest hits from the past decade was. The Big Bang Theory. Well, if you get see if you get Paramount Plus, you don't get access to The Big Bang Theory because the show was actually produced by Warner Brothers, mm -hmm. so it's over on HBO Max. Right. So even even having CBS, like it's it's nice in theory, and and, and it, there are definitely some CBS CBS produced shows that um, people will sign up for, but it doesn't just because you have CBS or Paramount Plus doesn't mean you get access to what you traditionally think of as all the CBS shows because of the way television studios and production companies have um, sold the rights and, and, and their shows off to different channels over the, over the years. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see because like of, of all of them, I could see that one probably being the first one to just kind of like call it quits. Yeah. Because not any like thing bad about them. Like I said, they got plenty of good stuff, but it's just, is it enough to make you sign up for it? You know what I mean? It's like I always say with, like, Disney Plus, like, the fact that it's pretty impressive, the fact that they were able to get, they're the number two streaming service at this point, but they've only had, they were able to do that with just one show. Like, Mandalorian yeah. was their only premium new content available, and the rest was just all cat catalog stuff. And, that, like, that alone allowed them to become the second most subscribed to streaming service. As I just don't see that happening with peacock or paramount plus or whatever they don't have the they don't have that same pool unfortunately yeah so like, i could totally see like at one day maybe netflix is just like hey paramount like i wouldn't be surprised one of these days too if if netflix actually buys one of those like buys a paramount kind of thing a Not production just, studio yeah yeah like buy like because because uh, that's really one thing that they are missing because like, they are their own production studio yeah but I could totally see them at some point in the future, especially the way they've been throwing money around, like with uh, at Ryan Johnson in particular. That's another thing, too, like this. Uh, I'm wondering what this is actually going to do, like with Netflix being in the position they're in where they've just been kind of throwing money around, like with the Ryan Johnson thing in particular, and even with this, it's setting a, a, an interesting precedent. Because, like, what if someone, like, another, like, what if Steven Spielberg is trying to get a movie made? This is Steven, you know, Steven F. and Spielberg. Like, arguably the greatest filmmaker living right now. 
what if he goes and is trying to get a movie made and no one wants to give him the money to make it? And then like maybe Netflix is like, oh, we'll we'll give you like X amount to do it. But it's not like he doesn't think it's, you know, enough. It's not it's not what he's asking for. And then he'll call back to like, well, you gave Ryan Johnson a hundred million dollars <laughs> off the top. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? So it's like it, it, it actually like can set almost a dangerous precedent because now like other people are going to be like. They they what set a market. Mean? They set yeah. they set what the market price is on things, and and other people are going to be able to say, "Look, I, I have a bigger draw than Ryan Johnson." Yeah, it's like so. so you're telling me, like Steven Spielberg, me that I'm not worth as much as Ryan Johnson. Like yeah. it's essentially like the precedent they're stating. And the same with this billion dollar deal for Sony. If someone else came to them, it, it, it's going to be the same way. You know, if they're not. So it's interesting. I, I'm curious to see where that if that's going to pan out if it's going to have any long-term ramifications, but yeah, we'll just have to see in the end. I think this is a great deal for Sony. It was a great deal for Netflix. I'm curious to see where it goes in the future though. Yeah, for sure. So, but the question is guys, what do you think about this? Was it surprising to you? And who do you think got the better end of this deal? Was it Netflix or was it Sony? Let us know what you think down in the comments section below. All right, guys. So our next main topic here keeps us in the world of streaming, but over into HBO Max's domain here where our, our friend Samba TV again, I think we talked about them the other day with, um, they had some numbers about the Snyder Cut, but now they have some numbers with, and we're in regards to Godzilla versus Kong, where apparently that has been the most, the most viewed thing on HBO Max, even more so than Wonder Woman 84 when it came out, and when Justice League came out, Zack Snyder's Justice League. And I honestly, I found it more surprising that more people watched wonder woman than justice league in all honesty like that that was like i could honestly see godzilla versus kong being the top dog between the three but i i don't know maybe one it may be since wonder woman was kind of the first one that got the gate to be the hbo max you know day and date exclusive thing during the covid times it makes sense that it would have pretty high viewership but we 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 already kind of knew that it had you know, it didn't perform as well as they were hoping on HBO Max. And um, I don't know. I found it, I, again, I found it kind of more surprising that Justice League wasn't able to pass that just with the hype that was around the Snyder Cut for this long. But, John, uh, the, it's showing here that 3.6 million people watched uh, HBO Max or watched Godzilla vs. Kong on HBO Max. Do you, uh, you think those are big numbers? Are you surprised that it's, uh, you know, was able to surpass Wonder Woman 84 and uh, Justice League? No. <laughs> um, I mean, partly, I, I've been hearing, I've been reading, obviously, I really enjoyed Justice League when we did our review on it, um, which you can go back and watch. But I, I love Justice League. I thought it was a great film. I thought it was so much better than theatrical cut. 100%. But at the end of the day, Justice League is a director's cut. It's a substantial director's cut. There's two and a half hours of new footage that nobody had ever seen before. There's a complete reworking of the story. But at the end of the day, the beats are all the same. Batman gets the Justice League together. The Justice League fight and kind of lose to the main villain. And then they have to regroup, Superman, bring Superman back, and then fight the main villain again. All those beats exist in both the theatrical and the director's cut of the, and the extended cut or the, the Zack Snyder cut of the movie. So at the end of the day, you're essentially talking about a movie that came out a three years ago and B um, was had all the same story beats, just how they played out differently and C it, it got z almost zero marketing. Like you didn't, you weren't turning on the television and seeing commercials for, you know, subscribe to HBO Max to watch, you know, the new Justice League Snyder Cut. You weren't turning on YouTube and seeing ads run in front of your favorite YouTube channels saying, you know, go out and watch the Snyder Cut. You got all those ads. There was a huge marketing push behind Wonder Woman and Godzilla. Um, so at the end of the day, no, I'm, I'm not surprised that those two beat it. Um, and I, I think at the end of the day, I think they should have beat it. I mean, they're, like I said, those are both original films that nobody's seen anything about before besides a trailer here, here or there. Um, they're both movies that have, are established characters, established franchises that people are excited for and love. Um, so I, I, people want to make, 
it's it's funny. A lot of people, it's it's it, there's two sides of this. A lot of people want to make Justice League seem like a failure because it didn't reach the associated hype around the movie that everybody talks about. I think I think when they see the, the it trending on Twitter and things like that, they assume, oh, well, this movie's going to blow everything else out of the water. But then there's the other side of it that blows it up and says it was the greatest thing ever. And obviously, as with everything on social media in the world today, the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I think I think Justice League was a big success. Um, but I think Kong and Wonder Woman, if the numbers are accurate, and again, these are all numbers that come from third party, you know, analysts, and these aren't official numbers, so they need to be taken with a grain of salt. But if these numbers are accurate, then, um, you know, sure, that makes sense to me that a brand new Wonder Woman movie that nobody's ever seen before would be. And also, I think the other thing you have to take into account, especially with King, King Kong versus Godzilla, is you're taking two characters who normally carry their own movie. Um, and then you're combining them for the first time in what, 50 years. I mean, when was the last King Kong versus Godzilla 70s, 60s? Yeah. So, you know, nobody's seen these on, on, on film in a long, long time. Now, I guess the same could be said of justice league, except you did see him back in 2017. So, you know, I'm not surprised by these numbers at all. Um, there's also been a lot of box office talk about how, uh, the movie is grossed, I think, north of, I think, 69 million, maybe north of 70 million so far in its first two weeks, which is a record for any film since the pandemic began. Mm -hmm. And and again, I mean, you're looking at a lot of different uh, factors that are playing into that. I think a lot of people, the vaccine's out there, so a lot of people are feeling more comfortable. It hasn't, you know, it's not prevalent among everyone, but there's a large portion of society that feels more comfortable going back out now. Um but yeah, I, I'm I'm happy for it. I, I liked King Kong versus Godzilla. I'm glad it's doing well. I'm glad people are watching it. And to be honest, I'm glad HBO Max is getting more uh, getting more push or getting more. Uh, I can't think of the word I want. Um, <laughs> they're getting more penetration into the market, into the streaming market, because mm. I personally like uh, HBO Max and their content, and and I'd like to see the platform do well and they've obviously had their struggles yeah that's the thing i always find weird is that like like i said earlier like disney was able to get the second place in these streaming war wars with just the mandalorian essentially yeah. but hbo max and like h because hbo max is just it's, it's just hbo rebranded essentially which again we've talked about it numerous times it was a huge mistake on their part it would have been much better for it to be like warner plus and then you advertise like you get warner plus and it has hbo like tied in with it that's like sure. that's your your pitch like you get all this warner stuff and then hbo is included like much better deal it was very confusing with you had four different hbo's out there since so like it was really stupid but what i find interesting about uh this oh i guess let me finish that thought HBO Max is great. They're always pumping out. HBO is always pumping out content. They're like the king of content when it comes to original like series and like even their original movies are normally good. But like their original series are kind of like it's kind of like exactly like Netflix, but better because Netflix original movies generally kind of suck, but they have a lot of really good original series. It's kind of the same way with HBO Max. It's just that it's always consistent as opposed to Netflix where it's a it's a big wave. Like some of their original stuff is like they just buy it just to say it's an original thing. HBO doesn't do that, historically speaking. What I find interesting too about the Godzilla numbers though is that uh, it's weird because if you look, like the first Godzilla made 529 million, and then King of the Monsters was a substantial decline. You had yeah. King, you had a uh, Kong Skull Island come out in between these movies, and it it, it made more than Godzilla, which I find surprising. Because it wasn't as good, but in my opinion. But then King of the Monsters comes out and was a huge disappointment. So like them being a, like the franchise, you know, kind of combining being the same franchise at this point, coming out the gate and they've made over over 300 million in the pandemic for a franchise that was kind of on the decline in, in a lot of ways is a pretty huge deal. Yeah. And with that... There's been a lot of talk, like ever since the success of Godzilla at the box office, that if these studios are kind of rethinking the whole day and date release thing, like, you know, like, well, could we have made more money if, you know, we didn't do it on here? 
and my argument with that honestly is like well look how much money they made with it being day and date you know what i mean i think that's the more that's the story you, you should more be focusing on not how much more money could they have made if it wasn't day and date because i really don't i think the numbers kind of prove that it's really not making that big of an impact yeah. like the people who want to go to the theaters are still going to the theaters because you have to think too this is also in reduced capacity theaters so yeah. it's like there's only 25 percent of people even in most theaters right now and it was still able to make just it was able to set records for you know covid era box office stuff but i mean it was still able to make over 300 million dollars like and now it's like because i think most people have been thinking like well, what does this mean for, like, Black Widow? Like, is Disney looking at this and saying, like, you know, did we kick ourselves, you know, you know, in, in the ass here? It's like, by just announcing that we're going to do day and date with it. But Godzilla just made all this money at the box office. And, like, I don't think it's going to make as big as an effect as they think, especially since they're doing the whole Premier Access thing with it anyway. So people are going to have to pay for it if they want to watch it on streaming or download it illegally whichever one you want to do. But then, like, the people who still want to go to the theater are still going to go to the theaters. Like, I think there's a world where day and date can still, like, work. I mean, I think Godzilla vs. Kong actually proves that day and date still works. Could it have made more money outside of it? Sure. But in my mind, most of the people who chose to watch it on streaming wouldn't have gone to the theater to see it anyway. Like, they probably only watch it on streaming because they could. Mm -hmm. You know? Like, they, and then they would probably just wait until they could watch it on streaming then you know yeah. i think there's a larger number than people think of just the amount of people who aren't going to go to the theater to see it like just because it's the only place you can see it doesn't mean more people are going to go see it you know yeah i think I, I i saw an article that said basically what you just said earlier this week that the the success the relative success of kong godzilla versus kong shows that doing day and day doesn't hurt the box office or doesn't hurt it to any kind of quantifiable ex uh, extent. Um, I, I agree with that. I think, I think there are people that are going to go see a movie in a theater and they like the theater experience. That's the reason people go to the theater. That's the reason people put up with people on their cell phones or put up with, you know, the, the risk of having somebody bring their kid into a theater or, or that's, you know, because they enjoy, if it was strictly the fact that people just, just that that was their only way to watch a movie. I don't think a lot of people, you know, for, for the most part, there are some event movies. I think, you know, every year you have, you know, a handful, three, four or five movies that are big, giant, you know, movies that permeate the, the social consciousness and everybody's talking about in game is the most recent one. For example, I mean, everybody wanted to go see in game because they wanted to be part of that, that social conversation about it. And so, yeah, having that, be only available in theaters drove people to the theaters to see it. But I think there's a huge, there 95% of the films that come out, people will be more than happy to wait until they come home and watch them at home. If they're the type of person that wants to see a movie, you know, at home, if they prefer that kind of experience, but then there's plenty of people too, that if they want to see a movie in the theater, that's what, I mean, just, I mean, for years, that's what, when you talk to people about going out, we're, we're going to go out, where are you going to go do? One of the top, I would guess, three things that people say when they say they're going out is they're going to see a movie. Mm -hmm. If we're going to go out to eat, we're going to go out to get drinks, we're going to go see a movie. You know, I mean, those are, we're going to go out to a sporting event. Those are, the, when people say they're going out, that's what they mean. And just because an, a movie is available at home doesn't mean that people are going to stop going out. I mean, especially now, as, as we hope that the pandemic is winding down and people are getting the opportunity to go out more, that's going to drive people even more and more to want to go. And then, of course, this all ties in with, and we haven't talked about it, but the fact that HBO announced and Warner Brothers announced that this, this day and date release is only going to occur through the end of this year. They are not extending this to the films that come out next year. So. Right. That's the thing, like, despite how expensive movies, like, can be, because, like, we've said it before, like, for a family of five to go out and see a movie, that's an expensive venture. You're looking sure. at one, two hundred bucks after, if you get, like, food and everything included. It's still, despite that, one of the cheaper night outs that you can have yeah. for, for what you get, too. Like, it's a full, 
two to three hours worth of entertainment. You get food, drinks, you know, it's, it's, it's a night's worth of stuff. Yeah. So like, and especially if you just go with, you know, yourself or one other person, it's really inexpensive to do it as opposed to you go to a sporting event or something like that. You're paying upwards of a hundred dollars per ticket or at least around there. Yeah. And then the, the inflated the concession prices, which is, they're even worse than the movies. Oh yeah. You know, so it's like, it's way more like going, cause I think Chris Rock even said this when he was interviewed, like in the early days of the pandemic, he said that like going to the theater is like exactly what I just said. It's one of the cheaper things that you can even do like yeah. in, in general. And like you get, you get so much out of it. So like, I don't know. I just, I totally think that there's a world where day and date works. Like, and it's sure. fine because, like, these big tentpole movies are still going to make the money. No, I mean, in the end, like I said, like, yeah, they probably would have made more, but especially given like the current climate, like, there's like not everyone is willing to go anyway. Like, you know, like it just kind of is what it is. And you always have those people, like you said, and like, like I said before, that like, who just they don't care for the experience of going to the movie, they just want to watch the movie, like, at yeah. their leisure. One like, of my good friends, I don't think he's been to the theater in 20 years. I, you know, I think, right. you know, as soon as he got a family and kids and stuff, like you were talking about the price of it, but he just doesn't, he doesn't care. He's like, he, in his mind, his rationale is, look, I can wait till the thing, I can, I can wait till I can rent the video for a dollar 99 out of, or 99 cents or whatever it is at Redbox or, or even, you know, better for him. He gets a lot of his movies through the local library and he, he'll just put his name down and, you know, a movie comes out in the theaters in June by October, November, it's out on a home video and he can watch it, you know, with his family. And so, yeah, he waits a few months, but he gets the experience. He still enjoys watching movies. He just doesn't have, he, he also appreciates being able to save that money they used to spend yeah. and, you know, put it towards other family expenses or things. So mm -hmm. yeah, but that's, but that's, he's made his mind up. That's how he's going to watch movies. And I, I think that's, I don't think people make their determination based off of, Oh, this is the only way I can watch it is by going to the theater. So I'm going to go to the theater. No, I think people do it based off of a lot of other factors and that, that is one of them, yes, but it's not as impactful as maybe they're making it out to be. Yeah, and that's the thing too, like the because I believe, like at least right now, and I think I think going forward, it might have been a confirmed thing, but the theatrical window is getting reduced from the ninety days to the forty five days anymore. Yeah, and one of the reasons that's happening is not just because of like day and date and like COVID and all that stuff. It's mainly because like the past couple of years, especially, have proven that most people who are going to see a movie see it within the first two weeks of release, like yeah. in theaters. So like, there's just really no point in having exclusivity in the theater for three months when you're not getting, you're getting a fraction of percentage viewership after the, after two weeks, you're significantly like, you're already getting 50% less. Like each week drops like 50% for most movies. But yeah. You just look so, at the box office numbers for yeah. movies for the past 10 years. And yeah, I mean, there's a it's almost like a just a yeah. sharp steep hill that he drops off of yeah you're it's like 75 percent reduction in theater visits after two weeks so it's just not viable in, in addition to that too the new movies when they come out they take over entire cineplexes i mean mm -hmm. they're they're not just shown on two screens they push a bunch of movies off into you know where some screens are showing multiple movies throughout the day because all the other screens are filled up with the single big movie that just came out that week. Yeah. That's the thing. Like anymore, it's more viable for theaters and production studios to have a shorter window in all yeah. honesty. Cause like eventually if it gets to the point where no one's coming in to watch a movie in the theaters, it's just costing them money because they could have something else on there. Like more people might be interested in coming and watching like an older movie that they're doing a re-showing of as opposed to the fourth week of who knows what, you know, like, I don't know. Just, yeah, Sonic the Hedgehog in week four and five is not, you know, there's not probably something numbers, else that they can bring out. He may the one to see Sonic the Hedgehog went in weeks one or two. You know? Exactly. And that's just how it is with anything anymore. It's all front loaded. Yeah. So that theatrical window is going to continue to close like 45 days is kind of where it's going to be at now, but I could totally see it. And it, it varies per movie, but like realistically, I would say it's safe to say for any movie after the first month, you're you're getting a fraction of uh, revenue. The only benefit to that is like, and it's different per movie deal, but the theaters, they take like 
for X amount of time, and normally it's like the first week or weekend or like two weekends, they get a very small amount of the ticket sales. And then as the weeks go on, they get more and more money off the ticket sales because the theaters mainly make their money from the concessions and sure. everything. But the longer they have it in theaters, depending on the deal they made with the, that studio, they'll start to take more and more of a cut from the ticket sales. But again, when you're getting 100 viewings or 100 people come in to watch a movie and you're only getting, you know, five bucks for it, like it's really not just based on how much, you know, we, we've seen in COVID how much, you know, just the rent is for most of these theater venues. It's like thousands of dollars a month. If, you know, in a couple of days or a week, you're only getting 500 bucks from one movie because no one's coming in to see it. It's just kind of costing you money at that point. So, but it ends up working out to like the theaters only make like a third of anything for, of, off of any movie being there from ticket sales in the end. But either way, irrelevant for the story. But guys, the question is, what did you think about HBO Max, uh, the, the biggest viewing uh, movie on there to date being Godzilla vs. Kong? Were you surprised that it got more viewership than Wonder Woman and Justice League? Because I kind of am, just because, like I said, the Godzilla and Kong franchises were kind of on the decline. So it was just interesting to see that of all the, the, the big movies this year so far, like this is safe to say the biggest one. Like bigger than Tenet, bigger than Wonder Woman bigger than Justice League. So let us know what you think down in the comment section below. All right, guys, so our next topic here today is something that we talk about a lot, but we're, that we have to bring it up because we've, we've, we've mentioned it numerous times. We never knew that this movie was going to happen. It was like six to nine years ago we joke about, it, but I really do think at this point we're probably approaching that six six year mark if, at the very least of when our boy Dwayne The Rock Johnson was announced to play Black Adam. Well, it's, it's finally official. They have indeed confirmed that they are shooting. They got their, they got their like, what do they call these things again? I can believe Clappers? The, like, they're, they're cut, you know? That's, yeah. I forget what they're actually called. It's, it sounds bad for someone who does a show about movies and stuff. But either <laughs> way, they got it here. It, it, it's happening. It, it's happening. So this is, I really don't have much to say other than the fact that it, it happened before the Flash movie. Think about that. Both of those movies have been the two, DC movies in particular, but just movies in general that were kind of promised, announced, like, oh, it's going to happen, it's going to happen, and then it never happens. But this one's finally happening. And then I, I've said it before too, but after DC fandom, this movie shot up, just kind of like the Loki trailer did, like for the longest time, of the Disney Plus Marvel shows, Falcon Winter Soldier was always my most anticipated because Winter Soldier is one of my favorite MCU characters. But as soon as they that 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 Disney press conference, whatever the investors called, you know, meeting they had, where they unveiled all the shows and dropped all these trailers, that very first Loki trailer made that that show jumped to my most anticipated ever since. And it 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 just keeps happening too with even the most recent trailer. That's still the number one. But either way, this is about Black Adam. John, what do you what do you think about this? It's, it's finally happening. You got any thoughts on this? Woo! <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'm just I'm glad that they're uh, that, that they've you know put some put some scenes to film or tape or I guess memory at this point. We no longer use tape or yeah. film. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm ecstatic that it's happening. Uh, I think The Rock is. I can't think of a better choice to play the character. True. Um, so, so yeah, that's, uh, I've been looking forward to this for a long time and, and I'm uh, hopefully down to the wire now, or, or there's a light at the end of the tunnel as far as waiting for this movie to be out. Um, I do, I do worry that, you know, not to, not, not to wish ill will on anybody um, or, or put bad karma out there in the world, but you know, I do worry that DC has spent some of The Rock's prime years kind of right. messing around with what they're doing. Like, I mean, we should have had a Black Adam movie five years ago, and we should be talking about uh, a sequel or or even a third film in a, in a Shazam Black, and Black Adam. A Shazam movie. and Black, exactly. We should be talking about those in in twenty twenty one. Not oh, thank God we're finally getting a Black Adam movie. Um, 
So yeah, while I'm I'm super happy, it's also bittersweet in the fact that you think about what could have been um, with the DC universe and with with the Rock and Black Adam. So we'll see. I hope I hope that people are excited about it. I think that the Rock's name alone will draw plenty of attention to it because honestly, I don't think a lot of people have the first clue who Black Adam is in terms of the general public. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, and look it, how good Shazam did in theaters. I mean, it barely made any money. It, and it was like the best DCEU movie since Man of Steel. Yeah. Like, and the same goes for the JSA. Like there are components of this movie that make me just overwhelmed with excitement and enjoy it. The fact that I'm getting to see these characters, but I really am, you know, I'm well aware of the fact that, that for the general audience, these names don't mean anything and it's going to be on them to promote the movie properly and for the rock to really draw in people. But I hope they do. And I hope that it, it does very well so that we do get sequels and we don't have to wait, you know, five, six, seven, eight years for them as it, you know, we're currently in the holding pattern for, for a movie like man of steel. I mean, if this movie comes out and does man of steel business, are we then, you know, resigned to the fact that we're going to have to wait for Warner brothers to, I don't know, blank or get off the pot when it comes to making a sequel for it. I, I just, you know, I, 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 as with everything to do with Warner Brothers and DC these days, it's there's a good side and a bad side to it. And mm. and I'm, I'm just holding out hope that this falls on that good side. So we'll see. I mean, we live in a world where Shazam is getting a sequel and it made True. less than four hundred million dollars. But Man of Steel never got a sequel. Yeah, and it made just shy of eight hundred million dollars. Yeah, so it was it was between six and eight. I can't remember which one it is, but Man of Steel this is the best. I don't care what anybody says. That's the best DC movie to date. Like at least DC. You, I'm not going to say it's better than like a Dark Knight or anything like that. But sure, post post Dark Knight series, it's the best. Yeah. Like to this day, and then Shazam and Wonder Woman. After that, I don't know. They kind of jump places. But yeah, but I, it's still baffling that we live in a world where we get Shazam 2, we don't get Man of Steel 2. Like, it's, it's so weird. But I got two words for, for this movie, man. Dr. Fate. That's yeah. It. Like, that's all I care about. And freaking Pierce Brosnan's playing Dr. Fate on top of it. So it's like, it made that even made me more excited to see Dr. Fate in the movie. Because I love Dr. Fate. He's so much cooler than Dr. Strange. He's so much cooler. I mean, they're kind of like the same kind of, same kind of two coins, right? Mm -hmm. on the marvel and dc side but the dr fate lore is just like super i just wonder how much they're going to go into the jsa stuff because that was like the biggest shock out of fandom is that like it's not just a black adam movie because that for the longest time i was like what are they going to do with this movie because like he's he's not really an anti-hero like they, they try to make him out to be and that's what they're obviously going to do because the rock's playing him and you can't really have just i mean you can i mean joker worked but you, you don't really have a movie that's just, like, the villain the whole time. And that's, like, even Joker was not really a movie about the Joker going and killing people. It was about how a man can turn into someone like the Joker. Yeah. But with this, I was always just like, what are they even going to do with this if Shazam's not in it, for the most part? And so, I mean, having the JSA in there completely took me off guard, made me much more hype for it, and actually gave the movie, like, a clear direction to go that kind of made sense to where you can have black adam be like the bad guy for a while and have like a logical turn to goodness you know a come to jesus moment for him even though black adam really shouldn't have a come to jesus moment but and he may not you know we'll just have to wait and see but i don't know what do you think what do you think they're going to do with that you think in the end of this movie he's going to be like a good guy or you think he's going to be a bad guy i think he's going to be one of those like a venom yeah, yeah, he's going to have, he's going to be, um, I hate to use the term anti-hero because I just, I feel like it's more complex than that, or at least if it's done well, it's more than that. He's mm -hmm. going to be, his motivations are going to be right, it's going to be the way he goes about. Um, like a Thanos. Yeah, yeah, the way he goes about getting what he wants Punisher. out of things. Um, you know, I I have loved The Rock since wwf wwe days way back when like when he was you know uh 
the 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 heel in 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 the WWE and like and it, they would try and make him do things that people wouldn't like and people just loved, loved him more and more for it. <laughs> right. Like I mean that's where obviously he got his roots and his popularity took off from because he was the biggest name in wrestling for a good five year stretch there. Um, before the most he left. electrifying man, the most electrifying exactly. Um, that actually has meaning now. <laughs> wow, yeah, no, yeah, like, literal, literally, literally the most electrifying. Um, and so he's always, I've always loved the guy, and then he obviously went and started doing more and more films, and, and his films have always been entertaining. You know, the quality of them has fluctuated from time to time, but mm-hmm. but he's always been, I thought he's always been pretty good in everything he's done and and stuff, and he, he seems like a just really good guy in general he oh, does yeah. a lot for for people that to help people out that he doesn't even know and stuff and and so he's always been kind of this you know, guy that i i've always kind of looked up to and i think is a good role model for for people to look up to and um i've also heard recently that he is a big proponent of there being a man of steel too and that he would like black adam to face henry cavill's um Superman at some point on film. Oh, yeah. And I tell you what, if he gets Henry, if he is responsible for getting Henry Cavill back into the Cape and getting him back into a DCEU movie, um, he will jump even higher up on my list of people that I admire and, and hold in higher esteem because oh, yeah. that is something that I want more than just about anything else in entertainment nowadays. And, and I'm hoping, I'm kind of hoping that he can pull that off. Well, that's the thing, too. Like, uh, one of the reasons for that, too, is because him, uh, The Rock and Henry Cavill have the same agent. Oh, okay. So if there's going to be any, like, anybody who could sway that into happening, it would be The Rock. I was like, uh, they have, yeah, they have the same agent. So, I mean, they have sure. the same connections. But uh, what I want to see more than anything is, uh, was it a Black Adam or a Shazam movie? I can't remember. But they're in the movie. Um, it was an animated movie. Like Shazam has to go up against Black Adam, but Superman's there, and he uh, is Superman movie like Superman versus Black Adam or Black, I don't I forget what it was, but Black Adam was a bad guy, but it was like Shazam had to like end up being the one to defeat Black Adam, mm-hmm. and but Shaz- uh, Superman was there and kind of gave him like a pep talk, and he was like, "You can do it, dude!" Like whatever. Like I want to see that happen with yeah. I want that movie. I want the movie where Shazam has to take down Black Adam and Superman is there. To, to guide, you know, Billy along. Like, yeah. and say, like, you can do it, dude. You know, like, whatever. And that's what I always thought was weird, is now we have the Shazam family, so kind of, I don't know if we're really going to be able to get that, because that, that should have been a later thing. I don't know. That's a whole other story. But I want that damn movie. I want that movie. That'd yep. be good. So, question is, guys, what do you think about this? Are you are you excited to see that this movie is finally happening? I'm, I think I'm more surprised that it's happening in general, sure, but even before the Flash movie, I think that's quite surprising. But are you looking forward to it? Are you looking forward to the JSA being involved and Dr. Fate and all that stuff? Because that's what I'm hyped about. Whatever you think, let us know down well, in the comment section below. What's I'm up? just going to throw this. I know we kind of just did a wrap up there, but I'm going to throw this out there. Do it. Because this is going to be... This is going to be our kicking off point for whatever the DCEU is, basically. I mean, we haven't had a DCEU movie... Well, I guess Wonder Room 84, but Wonder Room 84. It's so disjointed. Yeah, exactly. Wonder Room 84 and both and Aquaman. Are those the most recent two? Yeah. Yeah. Shazam. And Shazam. All of those have been self contained. And Shazam did have that Superman appearance, though. True. It was the most connected out of Aquaman and Wonder Room 84, especially. True. Aquaman Um, had the one line about Justice League. So it was even more connected than the other ones. But this is really blowing out the universe because you're bringing oh, yeah. the JSA. You're bringing multiple characters in. They're not coming in just as cameos at the end of the movie. They're coming in as actual plot points, story. They're going to be part of the plot, part of the story. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how what this does, whether or not it establishes or reestablishes or ties in with the DCEU in general or a DC cinematic universe, or if this is just a one-off and they keep you know, the JSA and bl- the uh, Black Adam characters in their own kind of section. So anyway, we hadn't <clears throat> mentioned that part of it. I was, I was thinking about that earlier was how is this going to either establish or not establish or tie into any kind of big, you know, because because then we are going into the Flash after that and Flashpoints, which supposedly deals with the multiverse and all that. And I'm very curious how that's all going to work out. No, it's true because... 
can't remember if it's been 100% confirmed, but like, I did they say this is going to be taking place in the 80s? I don't remember that. It could be. I, I or just, even I like even before that, maybe because because the JSA is involved, so everybody assumed it was going to be like a prequel thing. Obviously, sure. like it's taking place like maybe even in the fifties or sixties. But I don't. It's going to be interesting what they do because are they just going to say that this is in modern day and then now we have the JSA as a mm -hmm. part of this current DCEU continuity or or what? You know, because I, I I am curious to see what happens from that because then we do have the Flash coming. Which who who knows where the hell that's going with the multiverse stuff, and then Walter Hamada and all them saying that they're looking at all their movies as being a part of a, a multiverse in general. So I mean, the Flash, even though it's the most connected to the previous DCEU stuff, could very well end up being the most disconnected, yeah, because they can take <clears> it in <throat> so many directions. So well, we could also um, have a, a well-established JSA by the time after this movie comes out, we could have a well-established JSA. For DC on film, but a completely non-existent JLA, <laughs> right? Which is weird. Or, or, or I guess I, I guess they would drop the A, but Justice League and Justice Society, which yeah. would be odd. It would be very weird, but I don't know. I, I'm just glad this movie's being made. Yeah, like in general, like I, it, it. And it's so hard to say where they're gonna. It's DC. It was what's Warner Brothers is DC film universe. Like I don't even know. It's 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 like its own obscure thing at this point. Yeah. Like I said, it, it, it's so strange that we're even in a world where Shazam gets a sequel before Man of Steel and it didn't do as well. So it's like, well, what is your what is your freaking what is making you want to make a sequel to a movie at that point? Because it's yeah. not financial gains like, you know, it's like Shazam was more critically well received, but you normally only care about money. So it's yeah. like you think you just make a Man of Steel, too, especially since you've had Henry show up in two other movies, three technically, if you want to count Snyder Cut. You know, it's just weird, man. It's just well, weird. That's the part that drives me nuts, too, is like there's this idea out there I've heard presented that they're trying to move away from the Snyder vision of stuff and the Snyder. And that's one of the reasons that Henry hasn't been secured or brought in to do another one is because he's so tied to the to the Snyder version of, of, of stuff. But but they're keeping Gal and they're keeping yeah. Jason Momoa and like what those guys, they're intrinsically tied to the, the Snyder verse stuff. Like fine. If you want to disavow all the Snyder justice league and the, the BVS and whatever, and you want to start your own thing, that's fine. But there's no reason you can't bring Henry Cavill back yeah. and have him continue playing super. It's absurd, especially since he wants to do it. Yeah. You got a guy who willingly wants to do it. And despite people not liking Man of Steel and, and all that stuff. Yes. They still like him in the role. Yes. Like 90% of everybody likes him in the role. And if, if, if they have a problem with the movie, they're like, ah, but he's still good as Superman. Like I, I guarantee like, no matter if they, whatever they do next with Superman, if it's not a Henry Cavill film, whoever they bring out is going to be compared to Henry Cavill. Oh, yeah. And I can't think of a single person that they're going to find that is going to be like, oh, well, okay, he's, he's better. No, that's just not going to happen. It's not. <clears throat> I will give credit to that Tyler Hoechlin kid on the CW, though, because he, sure. he really came into it. Like, I buy that he is a version of Superman. Yes. Even though his muscle suit's a bit, a bit much. <laughs> like, I, I like it's, it's a bit much. It's a bit obvious. But I, I think they're doing a good job on that show. I yeah. I think it's good. So I agree. That being said, let us know what you think about this down in the comments. Like, do you think Henry Cavill's ever going to get his sequel? Do you think he's going to appear in this movie? Let us know down in the comments section below. All right, guys, so our next topic here keeps us in the world of the DCEU or DC Universe, whatever it is, because a recent article came out, uh, a, Vanity, a Vanity Fair article came out with uh, Chris Terrio, who was a writer on BVS, Justice League, but uh, pro probably most predominantly his uh, Oscar-winning run on Argo with Ben Affleck. It was a great movie. If you haven't seen Argo, go watch Argo. Great movie. But uh, apparently... He's not really the only, I guess it's safe to say at this point, he's not the only person who was mad about how BVS and all that stuff turned out, but he is the, the one guy who's not afraid to come out and just say it. And I think he even says something very similar in his article. And John, I'm going to let you take the lead on this one because you had a chance to read through a little bit more than me about it. So sure. what did, uh, what kind of stuck out to you about, you know, this article that he had here? Um, I mean, just the general sense that it was just yet a nail and another nail in the coffin of the fact that WB or Warner Brothers 
did not allow these movies to be made with um without a lot of studio influence um and that and that Warner Brothers was more concerned with the idea of catching up to Marvel and the idea of hitting um different different release dates than it was with getting the stories and the characters done correctly in 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 a way that really would um that, that really they should have for characters that have existed for you know 80 plus going on 100 years um and so i i think he you know he says that you know in, in the article, he mentions that both uh, at the Snyder cut uh, or the Snyder cut of Justice League and the extended director's cut of um, Batman versus Superman are both far superior films to the theatrical cut. And unfortunately, the theatrical cut is what most people are familiar with or most people got their at least got their first impressions from and as we know very well with justice league but i think also to varying degrees with batman versus superman the reaction to both those was was generally negative i myself hated batman versus superman for a long time because my initial interactions or my initial viewings of them of it was the the um the theatrical versions and uh, you know i think i've mentioned this on stream before but but my 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 best example of this is is at the beginning of the film when when all the african warlords are murdered um and superman is blamed for the slaughter of these african warlords um in the theatrical cut the warlords are shot by luther's lex luther's men and superman is blamed for their death and it's like when has Superman ever used a gun? You're, you're telling me that Superman is being blamed for his death, but we see them get shot by these, these, uh, Luther guys. Like that implies that Superman flew in there with his AK 47, yeah. mowed these people down and then took off, which makes zero sense. Like he would just, if he wanted to kill that many people, he'd stand in the sky, heat vision them or fly down and fly through them. And that would be the, that would be the ball game. It would be over. Um, instead he brings a gun with him. No, but in the ultimate cut, it's shown that not only do they kill them with their guns, but then they burn the bodies, which thus implies that Superman used heat vision. And it just, it's done so much better. It gives more um, motivation, more context. explanation, context, thank you, um, to what goes on. So anyway, his point is, because Warner Brothers was insisting that they hit release dates and that they hit certain run times, so much of these films had to be butchered that they just don't hold up. They're not good films and they get a lot of criticism that's kind of justifiable, but it's not justifiable based on what the, the creators of the films were actually trying to do. Um, he One also, thing I saw too, though, is he yeah. mentions like you, if you take, and this is true with all film, but he was obviously referencing these things and, and, and primarily with Justice League, but he said if you take out all the moments that explore the actual characters, all the character moments, no one cares because I think you even said this too. Like no one cares about like the big CG fights and stuff. And yeah. he, he goes on to say something like that. It's like, you know, it turns out when you take all the, the character moments out of the movie, all the know, BFX in the world doesn't it doesn't help that. it. Yeah. yeah. Which was interesting because it, it is true. It's like, and that's one thing that Marvel's always done well is like, especially with these Disney Plus shows, it's like they're a lot more character driven. Yeah. Like, you know, they're not they don't rely on like, Falcon Winter Soldiers had some more action beats than WandaVision did, but it's still ultimately about the characters. Yeah. Which is that's what makes the movie. You well, and you look at a movie that Warner Brothers seems to love and be like, this is the model going forward in in was Todd Phillips Joker movie. Take out all the scenes where, you know, the Joker is getting beat up while he's out spinning the sign around and stuff. Take out that moment, you know, because it's it's not you know, it, it is in a, a big, exciting action moment or take out the moments when he's sitting at home talking to his mom and it's showing how of a, how much of a loner and a, a recluse he is. You know, take all that out of the movie and then play the movie. The movie plays completely differently. It doesn't make as much sense. You don't have the motivations and characters, character development. And, and so, yeah, you go to any movie and you remove that much of it. It's going to hurt the film. So he talks about that a, a great deal about how much the studio involvement really hurt these films. He also talks about just odd marketing choices, like um, the fact that the studio was, he feels the studio is probably behind the name 
Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice. He said in his versions and his scripts, he never gave the film a title and that that would not have been the title that he would have given it. But he felt that there was probably somebody in the marketing department that thought, well, we got to have the name Batman in there and we got to have the name Superman in there. We didn't have Superman and Man of Steel. Maybe that's why Man of Steel only made 650 or $700 million. Maybe if we had the name Superman had been there, it would have done better, which I, I don't don't think is the case but whatever because yeah. honestly good marketing was you have man steel come out because it fit the story and the tone and then the second one is called superman yeah because now he is superman that, yeah that's what should have happened yeah so uh, you know he goes on to talk about some of the the odd marketing stuff he also talks a, a great deal about how on batman versus superman <laughs> he was brought in after an initial script there was already a script that was written and that that in that script, you still had Batman branding people, but the, by the end of the film in that script, Batman brands Lex Luthor. And he said that there was no character development for Batman in that movie. Batman is a bitter, beaten down, he, he compares him to Ahab um, from Moby Dick. He's this, this man with this single-minded vision and determination to stop the Kryptonians because of the Kryptonian war and stop them at all costs. And he won't listen to reason or rationale, even, you know, those of that of people he's known his entire life, like Alfred. And he said when he came in, he really tried to give Bruce at least some redemption in that film and then was going to give him a, a, even more, as we see now in the Snyder Cut. Um, and he said, you know, Warner Brothers, after the initial reaction to Batman versus Superman and while they were filming Justice League, came in and were, were kind of like, up in arms about the tone and how dark it was and stuff. And his, his feeling was, Hey, when you brought me in, these films were even darker. I mean, my God, the script that you handed me to work on for Batman versus Superman was a very dark script. And here I am trying to lighten things and trying to bring some, some actual, you know, I can't think of what I want to say. Some actual, um, redemption or some, some, some hope to these humanity. films, humanity. Thank you to these films. And, and now I'm the problem that my, my stories, my dark tone, this is a tone that you guys established well before I even got here. So um, he kind of plays it up as there's a little bit of him, I think, kind of I think he's bit his tongue for the past um, five years uh, as as he's seen things that he worked on and actually felt proud of kind of get butchered. And this is kind of him kind of fighting back against that and saying, hey, look, um, uh, there were there were some there were some good things that happened in these films and 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 that was kind of butchered by the studio. So, um, yeah, it was an it was a definitely an interesting article. It's a long one, too. As it you is. See as I'm scrolling through. It. Yes. Yes. Um, and, you know, he 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 confirmed some of the stuff that's out there again. This one you just happened to stop on with Cyborg and Ray Fisher that he did. Ray Fisher did have input into the Cyborg character, and that's why he has such a better arc and, and is such an important integral part of the story in Zack Snyder's Justice League. So a lot of confirmation about a lot of the things you've been hearing or involving these movies for a while, and as well as just some new information here and there about them. So it was an interesting read. I would recommend people go look at it if they're interested at all in how this debacle all happened and unfolded with Warner Brothers. Yeah, and that's the thing too, honestly. I think that one of the biggest takeaways that I've had since the Snyder Cut came out is that the cyborg character was really good. Like he, he comes across as this like mopey kind of in both movies. He comes across as a very mopey kind of sad man, mm -hmm. robot man. But then in the Snyder cut, you actually see like his, his humanity and mm -hmm. he has a, he's a, a through line of the whole freaking movie. And, but he, you see that he is just like a, he's a robot with a heart. You know, like with the scene, like from the with the the, the woman at the ATM and all that stuff, yeah. and then like the the flashback to him at school helping people and all this stuff. So you he doesn't you see that in, in the Snyder cut, he's not just some like mopey dude. He's just a dude who's just dealing with a lot of internal pain, a lot of struggle. Like he doesn't know what to do. But you never got any of that with like the Whedon cut, which speaks to just what Terry was saying with like when you take out all these character moments, like the movie. I mean, the movie just sucks. It doesn't make any sense. Like. You just don't care. Yeah. Right? Well, so. and the one thing I also I, I didn't touch on was he talked about how Warner Brothers was more concerned with hitting release dates, but they were also um, 
I lost my train of thought. They were more concerned with hitting release dates, but they didn't even have the stories for what was coming after in yeah. any kind of way, shape, or form fleshed out. So he said he's sitting there writing Justice League, and he doesn't know how Warner Brothers is going to handle the Aquaman movie and talking underwater. Whether or not they're going to communicate telepathically, whether or not they're just going to talk in the water and they're going to be able to hear each other, or whether or not they're going to do these kind of air bubbles that Snyder used in the Snyder cut. He said Warner Brothers had no idea what they were going to do, and he couldn't get them to give him information. He had no idea what they were doing with Wonder Woman and how the Amazons were going to play. And, and you know, so when you don't have, when you're trying to build a world or build a movie that is involved with other franchises or in other, other films, but you don't have that information, you're kind of making up on the go and making adjustments as the studio comes back to you and says, well, wait a minute, this isn't going to work because we're going to do this and this. And it's just such a uh, half-assed, excuse, excuse my language, but half-assed way to, 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 to do a movie. You look at something like the MCU where you have this guiding voice and Kevin Feige and, and when, they, when they go to decide how Rocket Raccoon is going to communicate and look, that carries through not just from guardians but over into the avengers films and things like that so you have these cons this consistency which creates this overall tone this overall world that you can really buy into and mm -hmm. that was not warner brothers approach warner brothers approach was oh my god marvel's making a ton of money we should be too here here's when we're releasing movies go and make them like you yeah. know and we'll whatever so yeah well, and with that, too, I mean, even the Russos even said that when they shot the scenes with the Guardians in Infinity War, James Gunn was brought in. Yeah. Like, because he established the Guardians. So he was he was there to, like, help advise, if you will, just like he, he wrote the lines and, like, guided the scene because, like, even the Russos knew that, like, they're already established and want to make sure that, like, it's consistent with the things that came before it. And whether or not that was all the Russo's decision or if it was Kevin Feige's decision, it, it doesn't matter. It's just they had the foresight to actually do that, or as opposed to WB's just kind of shooting from the hip, yeah. like, with all this DC stuff, which is just, it's honestly insane when you, when you look at how much money is left on the table. You know, it's like they have these opportunities to make, to have something as successful as Marvel. Because, I mean, everyone knows the DC characters. I mean, all the main ones. There's no one bigger than Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. There's nothing bigger. Yeah. But people are more interested in seeing a freaking Iron Man movie these days, which is baffling. It's a world I never thought I would live in. <laughs> like, seriously, it's crazy. But it just goes to show that when you put the time and the effort and you give these things the attention and, um, you know, well, the attention that they deserve... And you do it when you do it right, it can be successful. It doesn't matter who the character is. You know, Rocket Raccoon can be a household name because, yeah. you know, Marvel didn't just say, hey, we need to have a Guardians movie in nine months. Go film something. They said, James Gunn, what's your vision for a Guardians movie? This is kind of what we're looking at. And you work with it and you give them time to. And then once you have all that lined up and you're ready to go, then sure, yeah, I understand you can set a date and work towards that date. But. That was not Warner Brothers approach seemed to be more, hey, let's pick some dates that we want really to get some movies out mm -hmm. and then we'll and then we'll work out everything else. Yeah, I mean, that was even proven with the Justice League stuff, because like it, sure. that already, it was news information, like established factual information that the studio had. I forget his name off the top of my head. I can't remember. But he want he made Joss Whedon stick to the initial release date of Justice League despite him wanting, have, wanting him to come in and retool the whole movie and all that, because the movie needed to come out before the end of the year so he could get his bonus. Yep. That was explicitly the only reason the movie even kept that release date, which is, is why I give Joss Whedon a lot of credit for making a somewhat palatable movie <laughs> in that short period of time that he had. It's, like, it's not only was it like you get thrown into something that you had nothing to do with, it was also, I have four and a half hours of a movie that you're not familiar with really at all. And I need you to cut it down to two hours and you have, you know, six months to do it. Yeah. Like that's a daunting task. Like and the fact that he was even able to get a, a, a watchable movie, maybe not a good movie, but even able to get it done. is pretty crazy. Like, yeah. So props to that. Like that's not something I would want to do at all. So question is, guys, did you have a chance to read this article that, uh, like I said, it's, if you just look up Vanity Fair, Chris Terrio, it is there. It's a very long article. Like I myself haven't even got through it all. 
but it is uh, there's some good information there. So if you ever wanted to hear of someone who's actually connected with, you know, the Hollywood world actually speak some truth, the same thing that a lot of people out there have kind of been feeling and even theorized. Here it is. This is a good one to read. So go check it out and let us know what you think down in the comment section below. All right, guys. So our our penultimate topic here before our Falcon Winter Soldier episode four spoiler discussion here. So there's just your quick warning for that. We're going to have that coming up here right after this topic here, because this one is kind of in the same vein as the whole the Rock and Black Adam movie where I just, we just never knew this movie was even going to really happen. And that one finally is. But this one is over in the Lucasfilm Disney World with uh, Indiana Jones 5, another movie much like Black Adam and the Flash where like it has been announced. They say this is going to happen, that's going to happen. I feel like arguably was the most unlikely of those three to, to even actually happen just given Harrison Ford's age at this point. Like, and especially since they've been dragging their feet with this, he's not getting any younger. And it's going to just become like more and more unreasonable to see someone of the age of Harrison Ford doing the things that they have Indy do, in all honesty. But we got our first kind of confirmation here that they are, they are indeed moving forward with this movie because they have cast Phoebe Waller-Bridge to be like co-lead or the, I guess the role hasn't been 100% like announced, but she's going to be like the co-lead in the film with Harrison Ford and John Williams himself is returning to do the score, which is another thing that I think is is, is a pretty big deal at this point is given, you know, he's getting up there in the age too, and it's not going to be expected. It's just, it's a shame that we're living in a world where like soon we're not going to have new John Williams music. And it's not, not because he's going to like just die like soon or anything, nothing like that dark, but it's just, I think he's given enough of his time. To especially to, to the movie music world. I mean, there's not a... You could hum any tune out there, and, like, if it's a John Williams one, you know it. And uh, that, that's a big deal in, in a lot of ways. But, John, we, we I think the biggest story here is that this movie's even still happening, personally. Um, I, I'm still kind of like The Flash and Black Adam. Like, I'll believe it once, you know, <clears throat> once I get the little clapper, I'll believe it's going to happen. We already have word that Steven Spielberg is not going to be directing this one. He's just going to be producing it, which is going to be interesting. It's pretty much the first Indiana Jones movie that's not going to have Spielberg or Lucas directly involved with it in, in, a, in an impactful way, for the most part. But uh, we have James Mangold coming in to direct, so that's cool. I think he could do good with it. Um, director of Logan, and then previously, what was it? Caton Leopold. Yeah. underrated movie good movie another movie with hugh jackman in it it's a good movie but john what do you think about uh bb waller bridge and john williams here coming into uh indiana jones 5 and what do you think about indiana jones 5 even happening um i i'm torn i i i, I like i'm i'm excited for it i i love the character indiana jones um i think that there's there's people were left with somewhat of a bad taste after Indiana Jones and the kingdom of crystal skull. True. And for that to be the last Indiana Jones film that we ever got, um, would be kind of a shame, but then it's also careful what you wish for, because, you know, <laughs> you know, th this could be worse. <laughs> um, yeah. you know, there's always that possibility out there. It's interesting that, you know, especially it's, it's, it's very interesting when you look at the fact of how much is changing, like, you know, we're, we're not going to, it's not going to be Steven Spielberg, um, directing it. And you look at things like Phoebe Waller bridge being cast. I love Phoebe Waller bridge. I, I Fleabag was a great show. And, um, I, I think she's a good actress and I think she'll, do well in the film but <clears throat> this movie's been in production for so long they've had the story available you know they've been writing the story or working on the story for so long i think it's pretty clear that she probably for whatever her role is was not being thought of as the role was being written so this role wasn't written for her she was cast in and she i hope she works out well for it but you hear about sometimes people write roles for certain actors and actresses. I think this is clearly not the case here because this movie's been in production or pre-production for so long that they're, they're just casting somebody who they th think fits the part well, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. I'm just saying it's, it, it, it's one of those things that we just have to wait and see. Um, 
So John Williams coming back. Hope you know. Um, I personally feel that music is such a vital component to any film. Um, it, the, it helps everything from the tone to just the the familiarity with the the settings and the characters from film to film. That that having that consistency will be nice, especially when you're losing it with the director um, leaving. And um, so we'll see. I, I think this film, unfortunately, has some pressure on it. And and on the one hand, you know, while I, I was worried that we wouldn't ever get to see it, uh, I am glad that they've taken their time with it. And I hope that they spent that time wisely and that they've taken the time to ensure that it is as good of an Indiana film, Jones film as, as they want it to be or as that we could get um, you know, nowadays, I, you know, I hope it's not just that it wasn't rushed and they, there aren't, there aren't as many issues with it that, that seem to kind of be involved with the kingdom of the crystal skull. So, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm in the same boat. Like I love all the Indiana Jones movies. I mean, kingdom of the crystal skull wasn't very good, but it wasn't like a dumpster fire by sure. any means. Um, but I was, I'm just honestly more surprised that they're moving forward with like continuing the story and not doing like a, like your classic, you know, a flashback to a younger day and they recasted Harrison, you know, like got like Chris Pratt in there or something to be the new one. Like that, I'm honestly more surprised they're doing that. Like they're actually, supposedly, I mean, we don't know. It hasn't really been confirmed if uh, it's going to focus on Indy in these, these years of his life, but that's kind of been what we, with the information we've been given, is that it's just going to be Harrison Ford being Indiana Jones again. So, Do you see this as possibly opening the door to him passing the torch to another actor to be Indy going forward or a version of Indy. I don't know. Cause that's what they were doing with Shia LaBeouf. Yeah. And I love Shia LaBeouf. Yeah. I didn't use him good in that movie, but I mean, they had him in like, I, I that's, I'm more curious. So they can just completely disregard the fact that he exists, that mud exists. Was his name mud, right? Yeah. yeah mud or something. That was, him and something that was like. his son. Right. Yeah. Like, so it's like, they're just going to dis cause that's, a, that's explicitly what that movie was trying to do. Like for the most sure. part, like it's like, Shia LaBeouf was like big with Steven Spielberg during that time. It was the time the Transformers stuff was happening. He was a producer on Transformers. That was his big role in there. Shia LaBeouf was like popping off there. And he's a fantastic actor. Like, I love Shia LaBeouf. I don't know if he would have been right to continue being Indiana Jones. I don't really think he fit that mold very well. Mm -hmm. Like I would, I would honestly see like people have said, like, like I mentioned, Chris Pratt, he would be a good person to kind of like step into that. Like I could see him being that that character in that way. He'd be kind of like his a mixture of Star Lord and his Jurassic World character. He'd be like mm -hmm. a good mix of that. Yeah. And like I could see him doing that, but like I just don't even know if it's worth it. Like Indiana Jones is so it, it's so intris intrinsically tied with Harrison, Harrison Ford, like more than Han Solo even. Like, I I agree, but I also think Indiana Jones just the character and the idea of Indiana Jones. You think it fits, could be like Bond? It's, yeah, it fits so well with the Bond type. I you can know, see that. you can do so many different stories with the, the 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 character that I think that having it be this kind of thing where you where you bring different actors in to give their interpretation of the character would work well. And you know, I I, I I don't know. Maybe Uncharted picks up the indie reins and becomes you know this generation's um indiana jones going forward um but i'm sure the studio i'm sure is paramount right i'm sure paramount doesn't want is it paramount that does indiana jones Do they have no this right? is lucasfilm lucasfilm yeah. okay so it's going to be disney then yeah it was a paramount that distributed because i always remember the paramount logo at the opening of raiders it didn't um, have the fox fanfare no, I'm pretty sure it's the Paramount logo because then it fades away into the mountains uh, where Indy is, hmm. the beginning of Raiders. I don't I remember. Think. I haven't um, watched indie, the Indy movies in a while. Well, regardless, so, so it's Lucasfilm. So I'm sure Lucasfilm doesn't want um, Uncharted to pick up the yeah. uh, to pick up the reins or whatever, however you want to put it, and, and be the be the kind of fortune hunter. John were good, uh, standard going forward, but it was paramount, but I, but okay, good. Um, but I think that, I think that, yeah, it's possible that, um, that could be what happens if, if, if Disney and Lucasfilm don't find a way to 
to make the film, make the series, the franchise more Bond esque. Yeah, reignite it. Because that's the thing too. Yeah. It's been so long, and then like it left such a like Crystal Skull left such a bad taste in everyone's mouth that like I feel like they if they wanted to go the Bond route, they missed their mark with it. Mm -hmm. Like, and this is just another step in the direction of not doing. It. Like, you know what I mean? Like they they set up the thing with you know, mud or whatever with Shia LaBeouf in the last one. And then it also was sucked for the most part. So like that would have been the time. But that's also such it. a weird way to do it. You're, you're taking an existing character and make it in bond. You just straight, it's the same character in all of them. You just yeah, recast yeah. the role. That's and, what they should have done. Like they should have not done crystal skull the way they did. And like that should have been when they recast and just, yeah. they established that like we're telling the new Indiana Jones stories with a new actor. Yeah. Like, but now that they've, cause then you would have had your, your trilogy of indie movies that were all beloved. And then you go into this new iteration of it, but they did the fourth one as a continuation and like doing this other. So I think it kind of like, it hurt its chances of yeah. being success, successful in that way. And like, that's why I kind of think they are bringing Harrison back and doing it this way. It's just the, the, to give redemption in all honesty and then maybe in 10 more years they'll reboot it and like i think know. that would be my ideal scenario is that you 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 give harrison a proper send-off you make this one of the you know make this one of the better films and, and and you do this as well as you can and hopefully it's a great film and it's a great end cap for harrison's indie run and then maybe in five years god willing harrison's able to come out and say you know they're gonna we're gonna relaunch um Indiana Jones and this is the new Indiana Jones and he you know almost literally in a press conference passes the torch torch yeah. to to a new actor so that it, you know so that you know everybody's more on board with it. I think it's always funny when you they recast and you never hear from the previous actor that played the role right. like what's going on. I think they've done that well with the bond. I think when Brosnan stopped being um thing i think he came out in support of daniel craig taking over the role and and so i think it would be kind of nice if if they could find a way to do that if they decide to go forward now maybe maybe disney lets it go maybe lucasfilm decides you know we we did ours we're going to do it we're going to develop a new ip and and have that going forward i just i don't in this day and age i don't see that them leaving it just to rest forever but yeah like I don't know, they have. If we're gonna get redemption for Harrison's Indy, I think we need redemption for in, uh, Harrison Ford's Han. But <laughs> well, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, like, yeah, I agree. We, we need we need redemption for the sequels in general, yeah. in my opinion. But either way, I, I'm just I'll wait and see what happens with this. I, I, I like you said, I'm a fan of uh, Phoebe Waller Bridge. I'm obviously a fan of John Williams. So I mean, never a problem to add talent. That's I mean that's what they're doing. So we'll just have to wait and see. Question is, guys, what do you think about this? Are you excited for Indiana Jones 5? Do you think, you know, at this point in time, they should have just done, you know, taken the Bond route with the Indiana Jones series? Or kind of like me, do you think at this point, they kind of missed their chances on that, and that's what they should have done with the fourth one? I don't know. Just let us know what you think down in the comment section below. All right, guys, so our final topic here, again, spoiler warning. This is going to be a spoiler-filled discussion of The Falcon and Winter Soldier Episode 4. Which, right off the top, I'm going to say was probably my favorite episode of the whole series so far. I thought the ending was good. It was very good. We Unfortunately, though, we didn't get any more Zemo dancing. So that's the only, that was the only detractor of this episode. But Zemo's been great. I'm going to say that off the top. I've loved Zemo in this whole thing. I don't know about you. What have you thought, before we get into it too much, about like the complete... I mean, it was. it's clearly been a... Uh, what am I looking for? A retcon, if you will, of the Zemo character in some ways, like not in like a bad way, like not not in a very like. I mean, it's a kind of on the nose way, but not in a way that is completely almost like, you know how like they did Luke in the sequel trilogy and it was like just so not in Luke's character what they did this. You didn't really have any with Zemo in Civil War. It's not like they 100% establish him to be this one way, and then now he's not, so it's, like, jarring. This is just, like, all right, they didn't really, you know, say that he was 
a rich baron and he was never really kind of as funny as he is in this and like but it's fine it works you know i mean have you have you liked the zemo character and what they've done with him throughout i have um i'll say that the tone zemo's the tone of the character for lack of a better way to put it has is is a little different i actually thought of this it's interesting to bring this because i thought of this the last time when i was when i was watching this latest episode um Zemo cracks some jokes and stuff in this series. And, and um, so I think that he, I, I've liked the character. I think they're doing a good job with him. I feel like in civil war, there was, they gave you motivation for why Zemo was doing what he was doing, but there really wasn't a whole lot of character development. There also wasn't really a whole lot of time for character development with the character of Zemo. They were doing Zemo. a lot, yeah. Yeah, he, there was so much else going on. He was the catalyst that was the rationale or the reasoning behind everything else that was going on. But that was his role to play in that film. In this, they're able to do a little more with him. Um, he, he didn't appear in the first episode at all. Uh, he gets mentioned at the end of the second, right? He gets mentioned yeah, at the so. end of the second. You get that one quick shot of him. So we've only had him for two episodes so far, and he's been great. I mean, he's 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 been some some uh, humor. He's he's also you know still got that kind of one track determined determination that he had. Um, but in Civil War, he was so bereft by the loss of his family that he was um, <clears throat> very very serious all the time very and so the tone of the character is a little different now you know we're also in a world where the blip happened and so we're five years removed or more than five years removed from the events of civil war so maybe there's some softening of the character or some softening of that sorrow and anguish that he felt um not loss of not softening of his determination to prevent it from ever happening again but still um it's been an interesting. It wasn't quite the the take on the character I expected. Um, that doesn't mean it's bad. I've actually enjoyed it quite a bit, um, and I like what they've done with him. I, I I think he's still they're they're showing him as a kind of a a manipulator, which is a good role for him to play. I'm really wondering. I thought for sure, and I'm jumping ahead, but I thought for sure we were going to see him get superpowers this week to kind of make it more in line with that what was, the comic version was. That was a th that was the thing. That was actually something that uh, I was speculating myself because yeah, in the comics he does get the serum at some point in some iteration. And but uh they've set up because that's the one thing that like even though they've changed like kind of his personality a little bit, we'll say like retconned that. Mm -hmm. Um they his character motivations have stayed true to yeah. what they were in Civil War. And that's kind of been he is so against like becoming well, he's so against like super soldiers and superheroes and like that's that's what they've established and they've stuck with that. So that was a real like it was something I was curious of what they were gonna do, right? Because like was he going to become the thing that he hates to yeah. further stop the, the you know, to better combat because that's a, a classic thing that always happens. Like you must become the thing that you hate, you know, I mean whatever. Um, in order to destroy and whatnot. So it's like, were they going to do that or were they going to keep, you know, consistent with his character motivations and like what he's been with doing? And they've, they've obviously, they've gone that route. So that was, I, I kind of liked that. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's more, it's more in tune with the character and what they've established it to be. And then they even had that scene where he asked Sam, like, would you take the serum if you could? And he, Sam immediately answered no as well. Yeah. So like that was it kind of gives us another that was another thing people were kind of speculating. Would like in the end, would Sam end up actually getting the serum and then like truly being like Captain America at that point? Truly. Sure. Which I, my whole thing with the Captain America thing is like Captain America is Steve Rogers. Like like that's you can put on the costume and you can put on the shield, but that doesn't make you Captain America. And that's even what Bucky and frickin' Sam say. Like, they essentially, and not, not that blatantly, but, like, that's their point with it. Like, you know, it's like, that's that's why Sam didn't want to keep the shield. Because he, he, he doesn't, he wouldn't live up to what Steve Rogers was. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's just, it doesn't make... I'm I'm curious of how they're gonna get Falcon to actually like do the thing, like put on the the stars and stripes suit, because we know that's coming. If you've seen the toy leaks, you know that's coming. And like, I'm curious of what's gonna make him change. Oh, I think we got it at the end of this episode. 
See, I see. Here's the thing: we can jump forward to the end here with it, but um, we'll, I mean, we can, we can, we can wait. We can no, play no, it no, out I'm if you want to, because okay. I don't want to forget the train of thought. Like, I think honestly, when this happened, I don't think that it. I think the government's just going to back him. They're just going to back his play. I don't think anything bad's going to come from this. They're going to say, "Yeah, he killed a terrorist." Like that terrorist just killed who his best friend at the time, but who was another government agent who was a freaking soldier, a U.S. soldier. Like I think the government's just going to be like, maybe give him a slap on the wrist. Like maybe you shouldn't have done that with so many people watching. But I think they're going to back him. I, I don't. I uh, see. I don't. I think don't this think is. So? I think you. I think that was the overwhelmingly. I mean, it was almost. It's a great shot. By yeah, the way. The, that's a horrific shot, but yeah. tonally, it's amazing. Um, that I think you had so many people. I think they 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 overplayed the fact that so many people were filming it because they were going to play up how this 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 image this scene is going to play in the, in the MCU universe. This is going to be on everybody's screen across the entire world, and it's going to stain the image of the United States in a way that's almost unfathomable unfathomable well, then why does sam get the stars and stripes suit at the end because and and this is this is what and this is what brings sam back this is why sam accepts the role and the responsibility first of all he he i think he's always he always had some reservations about giving up the shield because oh yeah because steve had had in effect chosen him mm -hmm. to carry on the legacy or asked or you know wanted him to do it so i think he was always torn um just about that um but i think the other i think the the bigger thing is that he this he he feels it's going to be his responsibility or he's the one that can redeem or restore the legacy of what steve has left because the legacy of of captain america the idea of captain america is now tarnished for, because of this act. And I think yeah. Falcon is going to see it as his responsibility to, to help restore Cap's standing in the world, his reputation in the world, and not leave this be the, the lasting thought that, that people should remember all the good that Steve did and not have this mark on it. Well, yeah, and that actually makes a lot of sense too, because you got to look at it in a way of like, maybe this is exactly why um, Steve chose sam instead of bucky yeah because like bucky was a bit of a wild card yeah. like bucky could have very well done this type mm -hmm. of thing and like not that he would like obviously we know that he wouldn't have at this point but you never know the wakandans they they had a, they backdoored his arm <laughs> so maybe they have a back door in his head too to be like if we need to trigger this boy we can't you know like for i don't think they would do that because it would yeah. really show that they are like some very devious manipulative people. Yeah, yeah that'd be a very bad thing the arm not a big deal that's like funny because it's like we gave the arm we'll take the arm <laughs> well and the arm like, could have also just been like you know, that could be an emergency fail safe if his arm ever got stuck in anything or something. Yeah. There's a number of different justifications for why the arm detaches a certain but way. But they never but told him that he that's could true. take it that's, off that way. That's though. very that, true. So that, that was they a, did build their own, yeah. it was their own fail safe. That was sure. their own little deviousness there. But I, I get that though. It's like, because that's the thing, like they show in the beginning, which was a great scene as well with him and Io and him uh, doing the, you know, the code words to see if he yeah. was actually healed from it and everything and uh this is a great scene i forget what my even train of thought was looking for this at this point well i think we were just talking about how bucky could have been could have done something like what what's his name or or, or, or the new cat u.s agent john US walker agent john walker he how he's, he's a given, wild card and he could have he's given something. some good scotch or bad name yeah all right I'm like this is this is not what happens when you drink Johnny Walker. Johnny Walker's <laughs> it's not really my scotch of choice. In all honesty, I I typically just get the twenty year doers. I think it tastes great. It's not as expensive as a Johnny Walker. You get a hell of a lot more than it. And uh, but it's giving Johnny Walker a bad name. Yeah, like, it's giving Johnny Walker a bad name. I think it's funny that they. Uh, I wonder if they intentionally did that when they made the character, like named him like after the whiskey. Possibly. <laughs> like, yeah. It's just. I don't know it's funny though um because they had they had john walker and then that like i said on last week's show uh they were calling the battlestar buck 
Bucky or Buck for short. Yeah. And it's like that was a, a racist like slander back in the so they had to change calling him Buck. Yeah. So it's like you had Buck and then you had the whiskey. I don't know. This is funny. Um, what was my point with this though? Well, I think um, you were talking about oh, we were like talking in about this Sam scene, Regina yeah, and why he chose. But he Sam. didn't have the arm on in the scene, did he? No, because that's so. what I was thinking. Like maybe they had that on there in to case. where if they when they were going through these trials here to see if he was cured. Like let's make sure that in cases don't work. We can at least take the arm off. Yeah. <laughs> like, at least he's then a one armed super soldier and not a. One armed, one vibranium armed super soldier, yeah. which is like arguably worse than just a super soldier. <laughs> like, I, I think it's, I think it's, I, I like my, my personal interpretation of it is look, we're providing him with this new arm, we're providing him with this. It's, he's our responsibility in a way. So we need a way to take him to, 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 to take him, take help help stop him if something does happen. Like, they would never put a weapon out into the world. They would never put a piece of technology out into the world that they didn't have a way of counteracting um, because they feel it's their responsibility to take it on. I, I like that much more than a, hey, you know, we're being sneaky and backdooring this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, absolutely. I mean, this was a great scene. It was about, it, this is why Winter Soldier, and like, like I said, too, it's the characters that you care about. Yep. You know what I mean? That's the thing they've always been writing. This is why Bucky and Winter Soldier has always been one of my favorite characters. Is partly just because Sebastian Stan's played him so damn well. Mm -hmm. Like, and this scene was great. Like, you felt all of his pain and everything he was going through. Like, because like he said it before, like, when when Tony in Civil War was like, do you remember them? And he's like, I remember all of them. Yeah. And then, like, you, you see that play through in the first episode of this when he's going through his, you know, making amends list and stuff. Like, he, he does remember all of them, and it does, you know, eat him up inside. And Sebastian Stan, he just plays it so well. Well, and this, is, this so scene well. is the beauty of this entire universe that they've built. This scene is what? a couple minutes, three mm -hmm. minutes into the film, into the show. And it's only a three minute film, but it hits like a ton of bricks because yeah. there is so much story and so much back history and they've woven it all together. So perfectly. It just shows when this stuff is done. Well, how impactful, how much, you know, you don't need big, long drawn out things in shows. You can do it in just a couple minutes and you have all that history and you can really, you know, have an emotional scene or, I mean, it's because you care. Yeah, like you, you care. Ca you, you, uh, you care. What did what did Darcy say? Uh, I'm invested. Yeah, she was, she was invested. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, but, and they, but they did. They, this is what Marvel does so well. I mean, they did it through WandaVision. They have these little scenes dealing with like Wanda's grief and stuff, and they it's just what is what is grief if not love persevering? Yeah. Great line. Yeah, great line. But yeah, man, Sebastian stands great. Like, he's just he, he plays. I wish I do. I do miss the hair. I think he, I think he looks. Winter Soldier <laughs> looks good with the hair. I miss yeah. the costume, honestly, too. I like the mask, you know, the more combat oh, yeah. mask. I think he looked cool as so. hell. Yeah, like and is now he does just kind of look like a dude. Like he doesn't. He doesn't. Really well, and we'll see. what we'll, we'll see. Well, I guess you know we've already gotten a clue as to what he might look like at the end, based off some of the toy releases. But he's just we'll, wearing the same outfit that he's wearing. We'll, we'll like, see what yeah. his role is. I think we're we're this 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 show is kind of dealing with him figuring out where he belongs obviously it was you know when he's talking with the doctor at the beginning of i don't think he's he says in the beginning of the series like I, I went from being this assassin to having just a moment of peace in wakanda being blipped out and going right back into a war for the all of existence like yeah right i, I haven't had a time to figure out who i am so we might by the end of this find out that he feels like he needs to be a part of the Avengers and might end up adopting a costume or maybe further down the line, he decides that after he's established a life for himself. But I think we're still kind of in this transition phase for, uh, Bucky. True. I am curious if he's going to get a costume though. Cause remember the toy leaks came out for like hot toys, for instance. Sure. They announced the winter soldier, uh, figure for the show. And it's just the, the blue, vest you know it's the a jacket coat, but he ripped yeah. the arm off yeah. you know it's just that yep. so it, it kind of <clears throat> indicates he doesn't get a, a super suit but then they've been withholding hot toys in particular has not released the falcon thing yet maybe just because we're not done with it but we've seen 
from the Marvel Select, um, like Hasbro line, the, the Falcon and Winter Soldier for this show. I think we talked about like two weeks ago. The the leaks came out that like he has the the red, white, and blue suit yeah. and the shield. Like and it's it's branded for the show, like Falcon. So like we know he gets the new super suit at the end, the Captain America suit. So yeah, I, I don't know. I'm curious if, if you know it doesn't seem like Bucky's gonna get any change with it at the end? Because I don't think in the end, I don't think Bucky actually really wants to do this stuff. No. Like, he's just, like, he's there. And this is, There are motivations for this as personal ties to this because it all ties to Sam and the shield. Yeah. So, like, he has, you know... He has a sense of duty. Yeah, for this. And, but, like... Yeah. And then, obviously, if the freaking world was ending again, like, he'd be there. But he's. I don't think he's going to be playing a role like steve did like going out on missions all the time like i'm sure if sam asked him to then he would help him but like and if thanos came and like like he'd definitely go help but i don't think this is something bucky bucky doesn't want to be a superhero it's like i don't think so anyway it doesn't seem like it yeah and i guess i guess i'm thinking that like we may not see the end. We may he may get his, he may redon his mask or something. There may be a threat in the future in a future Avengers film where he dons a, an outfit, a more classic superhero outfit um, that he doesn't quite have right now um, because he's needed for some for, for some big fight later on. We'll see. All right. I'm curious if like they're ever going because we we know this is a big serial, right? This has been going on for. 11 12 years almost at this point right mm-hmm. i'm wondering if there comes a time where yeah assuming sebastian Stan still even wants to do these movies it, it come time but if if we'll see him in the red white and blue yeah like, i think i think honestly we'll probably see chris evans in the red white and blue again before we see bucky in the red white and blue yeah but i don't know, i'm just curious because like we've because that's what kind of like i said we were talking off camera in the world they've set up here in the MCU, just like Zemo has had the character motivation of explicitly not wanting anything to do with super soldiers, so it made sense for him to immediately just destroy the serum. Um, uh, da, 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 what the hell was my train of thought? Bucky, uh, Bucky has been set up to where like he couldn't really ever put on the Captain America persona. You know, like he's done so much bad stuff that everybody knows he's done. Mm-hmm. Granted, he got the pardon for helping with, you know, Thanos and Endgame and all that stuff. And like the, he's obviously able to prove that he was mind controlled by Hydra. So it really wasn't like his intent to do all these things. But the public knows of the Winter Soldier. So it's it's more of a, a, a public persona thing. But anyway, like a sure. marketing thing for Captain America. Like they, they rolled John Walker out and they were like three-time Medal of Honor winner, like a, a, a recipient, not winner, but a recipient and like all oh, this, this and that. And it's like they're not going to... You bring out like the previously the Winter Soldier, the greatest assassin ever. Like he's our new Captain America. Like, you know what I mean? Like they don't want that. Like yeah. they, despite it being like not necessarily him or his fault, it's just not, it's not good marketing. Now at this point, given what John Walker has done, it would have been better hindsight 2020, but either way, let's, let's address this. Uh, just cause this scene came up here chronologically. <clears throat> I think this scene has obviously been a rumor going around that Sharon Carter is the power broker, right? I'm not the yeah. only person to say this. It's been a thing. A lot of people have been theorizing it. They've kind of left a little like, they had a couple scenes here and there that kind of indicate she's definitely into something more than freaking illegal art dealing, in, yeah. in my opinion. And I think this scene, you, you, the first one was after they went and killed the, the scientist and then like she got in the car she had her own driver for one but then she said like you know we've got bigger things to worry about or something that was i think our first kind of indication to like maybe there's definitely something more going on here but in this scene she's walking down this freaking alleyway there's like a roadblock of things uh, and there's just tons of armed men here that know exactly who she is it makes it makes it seem like she's she's in charge of all these people. I don't. In what world does an illegal arts dealer like need this much firepower? You know what I mean. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Like unless she is definitely 
more than just an illegal arts dealer. And then not to mention, she's like, she owns a couple satellites apparently yeah. at this point. So it's like, I'm, it's either she's working with the government still in some capacity, and this is all some big cover. Like, maybe she's even working for old man Steve Rogers at this point. Like, who the hell knows? But I don't think she's just an illegal arts dealer. So I think this episode lent the most credence to her actually being the power broker, in my opinion. I'm not buying into that. Like, don't go out there and say, you know, Rob said, like, this is this is it. Like, no, I'm not saying that. I don't think she's Mephisto. <laughs> I don't think she's Nightmare. But she she very well may be... The power broker. You think she's the power broker? You think you think I'm like I am that this one lent more credence to it, or? I mean, I, I understand I mean, the, the the theories, and yes, there's, there's clearly this is seems like an awfully big show of force for just an arts dealer, an illegal art dealer. Um, I personally hope that they don't, because I think. I think as they kind of established early on when we first, when she first came back was she was kind of done dirty by the, by not only the government, but also the, the Avengers who's kind of left hanging out to dry. If, if all the, if, if, if Steve Rogers ever did anything wrong during his career, this was probably making sure that she was not taken care of and wasn't left out in the lurch. Bit of an oversight. Yeah. Was, was, was what was probably one of his biggest miscues. Um, so I hope that that doesn't, translate into her being because the power broker seems to have no compunctions about just wiping people out you know just well just, they've just been verbal threats though we actually haven't uh, seen them i thought do anything. when they showed up i thought the whole power brokers guys when they showed up the first time to get um the woman on screen right now and, and their, business yeah when Carly they morgenthal <laughs> Polly, Carly, Carly, Carly Morgan. I don't know why I can't remember her name. When they first showed up to get Carly, remember she sent the guy out to to delay them so that the rest of them could get away. And the the power brokers men just got out and killed him. I mean, there was no. It wasn't even like they just were straight up. They just straight up killed him to get to them. So I think it was established that they don't have any her and at least her organization or the. I'm sorry, I say her. The power brokers organization doesn't have any issues with just wiping people out if they need to. Well, neither does the CIA. True. Which but, is what she, what but, she did. But, but, your, but your motivations behind that one is trying to ensure world peace or whatever. I think it would be interesting. We haven't seen Nick Fury in a while, and I know he's supposed to be coming back with the... Yeah, maybe she's working for him. Exactly. I know he's supposed to be coming back with the um, secret invasion storyline and, and show later on. But it'd be interesting because of it, because at the end, because the at thing some point, is, he dusted too, and he hasn't been back for very long either. So, like, how could she, like, you know what I mean? Like, he would have gotten her pardoned at this point. Like, they, Nick Fury would obviously not be, you know. But is not, Nick Fury involved with the government anymore? Well, he's part or of Sword. Or is he running his own organization now? We don't, I guess it's been kind of a gray area. It seemed like he was with Sword, but it, it also was because remember at the end of Cap, uh, Captain, Marvel, Captain Marvel, he's, he's up in the ship. the ship. Yeah. And we, everyone assumed that was Sword, but then WandaVision comes out. So and, uh, was it Sword? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, was he just chilling with the Skrulls in general? Because that's what, at this point, it seems like he was just chilling with the Skrulls. Well, and like, is Sword part of the U.S. government? Is that, are we supposed to. Because because Shield That's was an international, like, yeah. yeah. Because uh, what's her name, Monica Rambo's mom, like spun up Sword, and she yeah. was a pilot in the Air Force. So okay, so yeah, it's just a government thing, kind of like Shield was to some degree. But yeah, yeah. I don't know. They, they really haven't given us a lot of answers on that. But mm -hmm. Nick Fury, I don't know. Like if he would have, like, because she didn't get dusted. Yeah. So she's been here this whole time. That's why she was able to get all this power. He did get dusted. So, like, I don't know. It Honestly, just knowing that kind of lends more credence to the power broker thing. Mm -hmm. Just because, like, Nick Fury would, like, how would she be working for Nick Fury if he was he was gone? Yeah. You know? And even the, his second-in-command, Maria Hill, was gone, too. Yeah. And then she was, was working with S.H.I.E.L.D. at the time, but then S.H.I.E.L.D. got disbanded, and then... Yeah, who the hell knows? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. I feel like the power broker 
let's put it this way. If it's not Sharon Carter, do you think it's going to be someone that we know, or do you think it's going to be like just kind of this ambiguous role that they're just giving like a name to it? I don't know. My preference would be that it'd be kind of just, I, I don't know that we need the, oh my God, it's this person moment. The, um, the engineer, you know, the engineer moment. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that, I mean, I don't want to just see the same actors and, and characters be recycled in new roles throughout. I like, they do such a good job with establishing new characters and stuff. Like I, I'm, I'm perfectly fine. I, it does make sense. If, if it ends up being Sharon, it, at least story-wise, they've established why it would be the case and it makes sense. And, and yeah. I, I'm fine with it. I'm not saying I, but I just, because again, like I mentioned, that's the one thing that maybe Steve did wrong in his time as Captain America was not ensuring that she, and, and, and she seems not to Not just be, Steve too, like everybody. Sure, I, dude, everybody. She was a huge oversight sure. by the Avengers and the U.S. government. Like I said, they gave... They gave the Winter Soldier a pardon. Yeah. But they, like, somehow Sharon Carter just got forgotten. Yeah. Like, it's like it's, it's a kind of a huge oversight on it, which honestly, there's one kind of, like, inconsistency in some ways, because I feel like they don't just forget about you. Like, I mean, I know you're just a cog in an infinite wheel of, like, corruption, in all honesty, it was which was going on in, in this world at the time, but, like... I feel like it's just like that's how they're explaining her absence and like if we're giving her the story because it kind of fits because it's it honestly if you really think about it is like would it really have happened that way in real life like would it really have gone down that way it like I don't know yeah I mean I, it's I, kind of it, it's kind of a stretch but it's also a comic book thing so I kind of, you just kind of go well with and it. you get but you also have to remember too. That all happens in Civil War, and then it, by the end of Civil War, Cap and the other... I think what would have been made more sense or been more likely would have been if Cap had invited Sharon Carter into his, for lack of a better way to put it, secret Avengers group. Yeah, if he would sure. have, If she would have been part of that group of characters that were working outside the law on their own for such a long period of time. That would have made more sense. Um so, yeah, I mean, but but I guess in the scheme of things, like if she went underground and, you know, hid from not just the government, but Cap as well, maybe I, I, I don't know. There's just there's enough justification there. And I'm not such a stickler that I'm going to. Yeah, it's just a small thing. Yeah. Like in the real world, I don't think it would have worked out that way, but it, it's fine. And it makes sense for this. It's no, really no different than the retconning of Zemo. Like, it's fine. Yeah. It's like it's at, I, it, it's working and it's fine. I'm, I'm curious to see where it goes, but. Another fun thing to note is that in this scene, this this is the guy that inevitably gets killed by a uh, U.S. agent. I don't know if we're going to call him U.S. agent at this point, but who knows. Uh, but in this scene here, he, he talks about how he used to idolize Captain America and he used to like look up to the shield and all that stuff. And then yeah. he gets killed by that shield. A little foreshadowing, maybe. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little poetic in a way, not yeah. in a good way, but it is. And then uh, with Carly as well, I feel like this scene with um, her and Sam, I think was like the best we've seen of Sam Wilson's character. Oh, yeah. I time. love that they tied that back into his work with uh, yeah. PTSD and, and soldiers returning home. Like that was such a brilliant way to, to, to justify his, his desire to, to, to reach out to her on his own. It made sense. Yeah. It, 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 again, just like with Zemo, he's maintaining his character motivations and everything. It's consistent, mm -hmm. and this is consistent as well. He's like, he's just like, this is what I did for years, you know, like this is it. So like, it made sense, and he was able to appeal to her in some way too. So I liked that. And then she kind of went and took it a bit too far when she called his sister and threatened his nephews and stuff. Because as you see, he met her as Sam Wilson here, yeah, but then later. He met her as Falcon. Oh yeah, like and there's a there's a reason for that. Like and he's just like she, she gone too far at this point. And then there were I gotta bring this up too because like, obviously we have the scene where she drops the serums and stuff, and her boy Zemo starts breaking the serums, and then John Walker gets the one. Of course there was one, one there. <laughs> I wonder, do you think there's any more? Do you think that was the one? It's gonna be interesting. I I I was wondering if. Falcon would be accidentally 
I don't know what, given the serum at some point. Or someone I'm, does I'm, it in his sleep or some I'm, shit. Exactly. Well, yeah. And now I'm kind of curious going forward if something's going to happen where he's going to get it I, uh, some way. Because um, I, I think that that might be coming. But I, I, I think maybe this is the only one that's left. I think he might get it a different way, which I won't go into because it kind of ties into something that happened in the comics that not everybody may know about. So. Well, this is spoilers. This is spoilers. Okay, well, I mean, in the comics, one of the one of the ideas about how one of the young Avengers, Patriot, gets his um, powers is he's given a blood transfusion from his grandfather, mm -hmm. who was the original Captain America, the, the first African-American black Captain America. And he gets his powers because he gets this blood transfusion. So I'm wondering if maybe Sam at some point requires a blood transfusion. If he tries to go up against John Walker solo and ends up getting hurt, maybe Bucky has to give him a blood transfusion to help save his life. Or if, if there is more, I mean, I guess it could be more serum out there or something, but I, I, I do wonder if they're going to try or if they're going to get, have him be, you know, a new cat because I think it's all I think we're pretty clear it's going to head in that direction with him being the new cat but mm -hmm. it's just a question of whether or not he has the powers or not yeah that's the thing like because that's the thing too like he, he he straight up told Zemo like no he wouldn't take it yeah but with him kind of like with what Zemo was saying one of his things that he was saying was like when you take the super soldier serum like eventually you become a john walker kind of person like that's kind of what he was like getting at it was like the serum kind of takes control over you then he brought up like yeah but what about steve rogers yeah and, and then zemo even said like you know touche like well, there's only one steve Rogers, there's only, too, yeah. which is why steve rogers is captain america that's <laughs> the whole point uh but in the end this could kind of I don't know, show because like Bucky's obviously a wild card in there too. Like Zemo's not here trying to kill Bucky. Like he's trying to kill every other super soldier, but like he obviously knows that Bucky is kind of on the same vein as Steve Rogers. You yeah. know, because you know, it's like he's fine. And he is fine. He's a good guy. Like he's he's not a bad guy. Like he, he got brainwashed to do bad things. So there is evidence that, you know, not everyone would just go off the deep end with the serum and i'm wondering if like that would kind of be a crux to give like sam more you know lenience into taking it because it's like a means to an end like kind of like with zemo like was he gonna take it so that he could stop super soldiers better by becoming mm -hmm. one like if sam you know he kind of gets in his head and says you know well Steve chose me and like so maybe I'm I won't turn into that and like does it anyway like I don't know he's but he said no so I'm I'm curious to see what would happen like the blood transfusion thing is definitely possible I don't know I also kind of wonder too I, Zemo I love the character characterization of Zemo in this show he's he's like a master strategist he's he's playing everybody he's got all these different angles he's playing up like you know it, they, they all get in the fight there at the end and he's handcuffed and they come back and of course he's gone because he's been playing it up and planning all this stuff. Um, I like the idea that maybe somewhere down the line, Zemo, like maybe when they were in that shipping container with the guy who developed the serum, maybe he found a vial or found the way to make the serum. And so maybe Zemo goes off on his own and creates more of the serum. And then maybe he injects Falcon or injects Sam as a kind of like, just to just to be like you owe me like this like you may not have wanted it but you know you need it and you know that that you, I'm the one that's responsible for you having the ability to be who you need to be or whatever mm -hmm. just just as a way a further way to manipulate the people in the world around him I, I think it would be an interesting concept too if that ends up playing out yeah well the only thing is though too like John Walker's just one guy. And he's just one guy as a super soldier. Falcon's got Bucky, who is a super soldier. Yeah. So Bucky would have to be taken out of the equation in order for Falcon to, to like have to go up against John Walker by himself. John Walker is not up to the task of taking out both of them at the same time. No. Not going to happen. He'd no. get his ass kicked, 100%. Which was, this was also a great scene, too. Well, I think he gets his butt kicked by Bucky alone. And maybe, oh, yeah, Bucky would destroy yeah. him. 
Like, and, and, he, and he would have gotten his butt kicked by Falcon before he had the slow, slow oh, yeah. man. So I, yeah. I think it's still a close fight between the two of them. Yeah, exactly. So, but I mean, even this was a good scene too because it just kind of helped you. Like, this is when you knew he was going to take the serum after this when the Dora Milaje came in and just whooped everyone's ass. I, I love took his the, arm off. I like, love the line wherever the Dora Milaje are is where they have yeah, jurisdiction. Right. <laughs> it was just awesome. Which is funny because that's totally I my instant like the thing that went right into my mind was just like because US agents said that like you don't have jurisdiction here. And it's like, neither do you. Yeah. Like you're not in America right now, yeah. dude. Like, what are you talking about? Like, so it, it was funny that they said that because that's totally a line that great value cap would have said it's like captain america has jurisdiction wherever captain america is you know like it's, it's, so it was kind of funny in that regard yeah. um but yeah they whooped his ass they whooped all their asses <laughs> and then he even says like they weren't even super soldiers yeah. like all sad poor, poor little guy yeah. but yeah then we had the arm scene that was good stuff just taking that off with the pressure points that was good and then zemo gone wonder where he went I'd be curious, I'd be interested to know if he maybe did the, the the thing you said with the serum might be like maybe he did keep it but broke it for sh and he no one was watching so I don't know what it's like maybe if he broke them for show but then you know kept one yeah but at the same time no one was watching so there wouldn't really been a point to that uh, I don't know no, I I definitely I, I was I was on the fence of whether or not he'd end up taking it or not though and he obviously oh didn't. definitely yeah. yeah. When he picked it up and was holding it there for that beat. Yeah, I was like, well, this is it. Like, And then the, the, this is so funny, dude. I was watching. I have to bring this up because, like, I, it was painfully obvious that he took the serum here. Okay? They telegraphed it in many different ways. And I think I was talking to Rick about this on stream before you got on uh, this past Friday. I was watching another uh, another show where they, where they were talking about this and stuff. And people were like literally writing in and saying like do you think john walker took the serum like like i think he may have they they, they literally did like somehow it wasn't clear to them that he took the serum it was like like someone said like i i think john walker may have taken the serum he jumped out of that building and it didn't hurt him i'm like didn't he knock a guy like through a yeah, wall? He and, like, yeah, he literally kicked people twenty feet away from me. Bent a steel bar around. Yeah, exactly. Arm. Bending the he threw ball the like shield it. into a concrete wall. Yeah. All of these things happened up before, and it was like that. Just the jumping on the car is what made you think that. Yeah. It's like they literally right when he bent the bar, Sam was right there and saw it happen, and he said, "What did you do?" Yeah, like and like that was just like you knew right then he took the serum. Like you knew right then. Like, so I just thought it was funny. It was just like, guys, he obviously took the serum, okay? He took the serum. That was the whole point. That's why he lost his shit at the end, because this is exactly why Zemo doesn't want there to be super soldiers. This is living proof. Which, if you go back to Captain America First Avenger, when uh, Erskine, who made the first super soldier serum, he kept saying, like, his thing was like, it you you don't want the best trained person to do it's got to be someone who's like pure of heart yeah you know what i mean so it won't as it won't corrupt them the yeah. power won't corrupt them that's not like their end game is having power when you have like this is what you get like nine times out of ten if you just give it to the, the most powerful person in the room like the the power kind of consumes them look at thanos it's the same concept yeah but this was good though. I and I think though, in the end, since we've made it full circle now to the the end scene here, the end of it again, we'll watch the the bit the pipe bend. Yeah, because right here he kicked him like thirty feet down yeah. the steps, and oh, then yeah. like literally right, and he's just like, dude, like, and he's just throwing <laughs> him like nonchalantly like fifteen feet, like, oh yeah, like, and he's looking all pissed off, like, this is what it is. But, um, damn it, what was my point? I completely forget what I was going to say. I don't know. I don't remember anymore. I, I love this episode, though, in the end. I thought oh, it was yeah. great, dude. I thought it was really good. And, like, the only other thing I got to bring up, too, is, just, like, people keep saying, like, oh, we only have two more episodes left, and by four episodes in, we still had five episodes of Wanda. It's like, these episodes are twice as long. We've had just as much content as WandaVision. And they're just 
twice as long. This sure. episode was 53 minutes long, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, 53 minutes long. That's with credits, but either way. So it was like 48 minutes of, you know, WandaVision episodes were sometimes 22 minutes. Like, like I don't know. I think the pacing of the this show is far and away better than the, the, the WandaVision, in my opinion. Yeah. It fit for WandaVision, but like, dude, as I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Every time I watched WandaVision... I was like just getting into it. The show just picked up and then the credits rolled like every time with this. It's like, I remember like halfway through this one or maybe a little over halfway, but not three fourths of the way through. I was like, this is really good, dude. I hope it's not like about to end. And then I, you know, hit up to see how much was left. And there was still like 20 minutes. I was just like, Oh yeah, this is good. I got 20 more minutes. This is yep. good. Like, Oh, I'm loving the pace of it. So I'm I'm hoping that uh, Loki is the same way, like because that's the one thing we haven't been told is like how long the Loki show, like how many episodes are in it, and how long the episodes are going to be. Still a big question mark. The only other thing that was a uh, kind of like poetic with this scene is that he ends up killing the guy with the same move that Steve Rogers did not kill Tony with in Civil War. Yeah, like at the very end of Civil War when they were fighting, he he had the shield up and he was beating him. He broke the arc reactor stuff on his chest, but then he threw the shield down. He stopped. He did not, and this was not Iron Man. This was just a dude who didn't actually kill his friend, who he was, you know, which was his main motivation at this point. He was just mad. But again, I think the government's gonna back him. Like I think they're gonna just say he killed a terrorist. Like, yeah, it was bad. Maybe he shouldn't have done it in public. But I think that's honestly that conversation is going to happen behind closed doors. He's going to get like a scolding from the teacher about doing this in public in that way. But ultimately, they're not going to like reprimand them in any sort of negative way. They're going to make public statements saying that like the man he killed was a terrorist. This was in the heat of battle. You know, it was like wartime kind of thing. He just killed the, the the person he just killed had just killed his friend, even though it wasn't the same person. That's what they're going to say to give credence to his actions in the public eye. That's what I think is going to happen. Yeah, I don't. I, I think the optics of this are just too bad. You think I so? Think, I think. I mean, look at him. He's standing over. A, he he was standing over a helpless person, an unarmed helpless person. Super soldier aside, because yeah, he's super soldier. he's wearing a super soldier costume. Whether or not the public knows he's a super soldier or thinks he's a regular guy, he's standing over a guy in a super soldier costume with a super soldier costume on, and he just straight up murders him. So the optics of that are going. While while yes, the government may want to brush that aside. And also, in addition to that, I think you have to have a reason that the government gives Sam the costume or makes Sam. And I think the government gives Sam the costume to distance itself from this specific act. I don't know. I, I, I honestly think this whole thing will wrap up, like whatever they do with this. I don't think he actually gets the suit until like the, the, the story arc is going to happen. And this is the last episode, the last 20 minutes of wrapping everything up, right? maybe setting things up for the future and stuff and they're going to skip time like they're going to do a skip ahead hmm. like six months later or one year later and then you're going to see falcon flying through and then landing somewhere with the red white and blue suit i don't think it's actually going to be a part of this arc i think I, it's going to be have, the, the the crux of it all at the end i think you have Rhodey come back to him and say hey look they know they screwed up and this is they need you they need you to be cap we, you know steve needs you to be cap and to, do you think to steve get... shows up and makes him do it old man steve it would be shocking to me if they did um if, i also if anybody don't anybody could convince him it'd be him sure i just don't know yeah definitely i just don't know how that how i don't know that there's enough story time left to explain all that like who develops the time machine does it do they do they go talk with banner and banner brings the time rigs up the time machine to send somebody back to get steve to come get him well no this could be old man we know old man steve's here he met him on the park bench like he's just exists so you in... think old man steve exists in this 
that's what we were, that's how it was set up. I guess I kind of assumed old man Steve went back to his timeline, that he came back to give him the shield. And oh, no, because they've even said, uh, like, the writers, uh, uh, McFeely and Marcus and McFeely said that, like, the end game time hopping thing like they never really developed the the rules like in logistics behind it because old man steve directly conflicts with what they set up before to where you they make the branch realities yeah because they, they even said like th at the end like he was just there on the park bench because he knew they were going to be there at that time so that was old man steve like he lived his life and just came to the park bench like, so, like, he didn't take the time machine to get there. He was just there. Oh, I see what you're saying. You okay. know what I mean? So, so like, he's just time caught up with him. And Exactly. Okay. That's how, which directly conflicted with what they set up before, but they've admitted that. Like, the, the writers admitted it. It's like they foregone, like, the Well, Steve the just plot. created, Steve created a new branch by going off, and we're now on this branch, right? Steve created a new branch by going off, live with Peggy. Yeah, but it, by virtue of that, he wouldn't have been there on the bench because he would have been in that other timeline. Okay. You know what I mean? That because That's where... The time travel it, headache is starting to problem. kick in. Exactly. But e either way, at the end You're of right. Endgame, we're led to believe, based on what the, the movie showed us, not the rules they set up, but literally what the, the, the scene is that old man Steve is there. Like he, he still exists in he, this yeah, universe. He's there somewhere. Yes. He was there to give him the shield, so he's still there. So you're, unless you're he right. unless yeah. he died or something, which I'm sure we would have freaking known about at this point. Like, um, like maybe he shows up just to give him another little pep talk. Like, yeah, you gotta do because at this point too, that would mean you know what is weird about that that I just thought of. He had this is another thing that doesn't make sense. They had Peggy's funeral in C Civil War, so why would old man Steve have waited until the end of Endgame to show himself? Well, I guess because he just did all the other stuff. Yeah. I mean, he was Because he was still his young he's person. Still, his younger <laughs> this persona is still there. a time travel there. problem, dude. Yeah. time travel problem. Yeah, well, time and, and, and the idea is, I think the idea is that the events of of Peggy's funeral happen in a different branch. Once Steve goes back and starts living with Peggy, that creates a whole new branch of the timeline. Right. It and would've. so and so that's the branch that we're on now or the the universe that we're on now. I don't know. That's I the also, problem is that would have been its own thing and then because Steve would have never came back. But they had Steve show up to hand off the shield. So I also in my head I'm sense. perfectly I'm perfectly fine saying that old man Steve lived all the way up on his branch, on his Peggy timeline branch, and then when he hit the time where he needed to come back and give the shield back to Sam, he found machine. he found Bruce Banner or whatever. He went he went to this park where they had just sent him from and said, "Hey guys, I need you to send me back to my original timeline. We've actually been living in a branch." I'm I'm fine in my own head justifying yeah, it that way just too. to make it more simple. But well, that's yeah. the thing that's always was so weird about him doing that and them saying that it would create an alternate reality is because so you're telling me. He goes back and starts this whole new life with Peggy and just doesn't be Captain America the whole time. Like, he lets all the events unfold. The way that, yeah. It, but doesn't help. Sure. Like, it's it's odd. It doesn't make any sense. But sure. either way, who cares? We got The scene was just there to pretty much it just set this stuff up more than anything. Like, it, mm -hmm. it, it served a purpose and it was a way to give Chris Evans a send-off, even though he's already coming back at, for, for something. But that's the thing, too. We, we have news that Chris Evans was coming back, even though he came out and said... News to me, pretty sure he was just playing coy with that at this point. But they could have been this. They could have shot that quick old man Steve thing for it. Like, yeah, I don't know. Who knows? We'll just have to wait and see. I'm looking forward to it, though. We got two episodes left. So, you got anything else you want to add on this one? No. Well, then, John, tell everyone, tell everybody where they can find you online. We'll wrap this thing up. We went on uh, for like 50 is, minutes here. This is my. You can find me over on Instagram and Twitter at Nightwing underscore K. Um, I'm kind of wondering if I should post some Rick Metz ish stuff today, you know, since I'm kind of filling in the role of him in yeah. the studio today. But go back to my regular, we'll see. See if I can find something funny to post on it as if I was him. So, right. <laughs> but that's where you find me. 
then you can follow me simply here at Sir Rob Bifo. And then don't forget, you can submit topics and questions to the show by emailing us simply at honestandoneducated at gmail.com. That's honestandoneducated at gmail.com. If I carry this on for another two and a half minutes, we would have had our spoiler discussion last exactly as long as the episode itself. <laughs> Think about that. So you could watch this instead of the show. And since we kind of did a play-by-play, You'd be all caught up. Yeah. So think about that for a minute. And then also, we have our uh, every Wednesday, we have the collectible reviews. The hot toy, most recent one was the Hot Toys Gladiator Hulk. Great figure. It's hard for me to decide. I'm, 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 I'm thinking I'm still going to sell them, but I haven't I, I haven't fully decided yet. So I don't know. Like, I, John, what, would you keep it or sell it? I don't ask me, man. I, I, I would keep all my figures. So. True. <laughs> my only problem with him is like, if I keep him, I got to get Gladiator Thor. Gladiator Thor is like 500 bucks. Look how big he is compared to Durrell, dude. He's a big the, the boy. Space, the space that he takes up. Dude, is, yeah. I know. I got to put him in a best of. I do yeah. keep him. That's the other problem. But either way, every Wednesday, Hot Toys and Collectible Reviews go up to so check those out. That was the most recent one. Then every Friday, we do some live streaming. So come hang out with us then. And then I'll... I'll also, you know, like and subscribe, do all that sort of fun stuff. And then, as always, this is this episode will also be up on podcast form. So, you know, go subscribe to the podcast if you can't always, you know, watch it here on YouTube. But that'll do it for us today, guys. Thanks for watching. And until next time, take care. <laughs>